there's just the bridge risk. People understate the bridge risk and events like this kind of highlight what a mistake it is to understate the bridge risk. Bankless Nation, happy first week of August. David, it's Friday morning. What time is it? Oh, Ryan, it's the Friday Bankless Weekly Roll-Up Time, where we cover the entire week of news in crypto, which is always an ambitious endeavor, yet we persevere on into the frontier, nonetheless. Into the frontier, that's right. And uh, I got to remind you, enjoy this roll-up with a cup of coffee. Yeah, David, you, you said you got a, a coffee upgrade yeah. earlier this week, and I forgot to ask you about it. So, uh, you know, how's coffee at the apartment in in New York? You know, coffee's, coffee's a, a tough thing. I, I was making my coffee with an AeroPress, which I love. Um, that is good. But, uh, it's time-consuming. Really, it's a little time-consuming. It's a little laborious. Uh, it's really meant for, like, camping or just, like, things when you're in a pinch. So yeah. I, got, I got a Chemex, which is, you know, Definitely like a, st- a standard. It's not nothing special, uh, but it's just is like that drip. Okay. MX? Yeah, it's a it's a pour over. Yeah, okay. um, uh, it's, it's a pour over. more suited to like the particular ground that I have and then uh, the kettle that okay. I have. Um, so def- definitely got an upgrade, but still still lots of work to be done on my coffee setup. So I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> I'm glad you're in better shape, and I know it's a <laughs> continuous improvement. Just uh, Dave's got to remind you, just don't like put all things, in your coffee yeah. <laughs> or it becomes a beverage. <laughs> Uh, all right, we're not talking about coffee today. We're talking about crypto, Aww. and a lot happened as usual. What's uh, the first thing we're going to cover today? Uh, yeah, it's a, a bad week for, for crypto this week. Some some exploits, uh, another bridge hack. Uh, so reset the clock on that one. Zero days since our last accident. Uh, Nomad was hacked for almost $200 million on a smart contract exploit. Uh, so we'll go into how that happened because it's very unique, actually. The, the f- a hack, first of its kind of a hack. Uh, and so we'll, we'll talk about that and kind of what it means for the whole like multi-layer one thesis. Speaking of hacks... Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, Almost 10,000 Solana wallets were just randomly drained this week as well. Also also a unique hack. That's not supposed to happen. And uh, a lot of the week was spent with people trying to figure out how in the world this happened. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about that and the uh, the conclusion of what happened with this wallet hack. Pretty alarming. What's the other thing we're going to cover? And lastly, there's just been a bunch of hubbub, a bunch of drama about the ETH POW chain, the ETH proof of work chain that is probably going to come out of uh, the fork. When, once we merge, we're going to leave a proof of work chain behind. And so some people are uh, descending upon that proof of work chain as a shelling point. Are you, listener, about to get some free ETH POW? Pow ETH. Uh, please. Yes. Yeah. Please. Well, uh, I, personally, <laughs> I wouldn't get your hopes up. We'll talk about that. Well, I don't know. I'm a little more bullish on it. So we'll definitely talk about that. And of course, if you like the weekly roll up, you like bankless content, make sure you like, subscribe, rate, and review. If you are listening to this on a podcast channel, on Spotify especially, you can now get this in video format. There's always better in video, mm-hmm. seeing faces mm-hmm. along with the words. David, before we get into it, got to relay a quick message from our friends and sponsors at Forda. Uh, did you know in 2021, that was just last year, speaking of hacks, we were talking about hacks in the intro, there's $2.3 billion in crypto Web3 related hacks. And Forda has something to help with this. What is Forda doing, David? Uh, Forda is a live smart contract monitoring service. And so what they do is they monitor the mempool. Uh, and so, you know, there's plenty of things that you need to do as a smart contract dev, like, you know, go through audits, do formal verification. But there's still plenty of stuff you can also do while your smart contracts are live, you know, in, in the wild, live in production. Uh, and there are types of transactions that can be detected that are incoming that are known to be like malicious like they drain treasuries they hack bridges you know they mess with your governance or whatever uh and so forda there, there's that like video game that uh way back when uh, in the 90s like this meteor game where the meteors were coming in and they would you gotta, shoot, like, them. And you gotta shoot them before they Snipe. hit the earth right yeah. uh so like they would zap the incoming meteors this is what forda does for incoming malicious transactions and so you can identify a set of transactions that if they do this then you know they're malicious and forda will zap them before they get into your into your smart contract. Uh, and so there's over 36 billion in TVL monitored by Forda's decentralized network, uh, including uh, protocols and applications like DYDX, Compound, Balancer, Maker, Lido, Yuma, uh, not, not Nomad. Not Nomad. Um, <laughs> uh, so may, maybe they could have used, used Forda. Yeah. Uh, there's a link yeah, well, in the show notes if you are interested in learning more about getting a smart contract uh, exploit zapper on your on your squad. 
one one thing I know is you don't want to find out that your smart contract has been hacked on Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> you want to receive some alert <laughs> and have a defense a system set up. So Forda Monitoring is, is there for that. And of course, Forda, thank you for sponsoring this message. Ryan, shall we get into markets? Yeah, let's do it. What's Bitcoin showing us this week? I'm going to show some charts. Yeah, got, got some new charts on the screen. Bitcoin, we are down a whopping 0.9%, which I would consider flat. I would consider that flat on the week. Uh, started the uh, started the week at twenty three thousand one hundred dollars, ending the week at twenty two thousand nine hundred dollars. Flat on the week. Flat on the week. Just flat on the week. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Neither up nor down. Just tepid. Just flat. How about ETH? <laughs> Same thing. Yeah. Started the week at sixteen forty, ending the week at sixteen twenty, down one point five percent. Again, I would just consider that flat. That is a flat week. All right, David, how about the ETH Bitcoin ratio? What's that looking like on the week? Yeah, super flat on the week, down okay. half of a percent at 0. 0.0707. So nothing. 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 Market's still deciding. Bitcoin yeah. or ETH. Yeah, I don't know. So Bitcoin, Bitcoin, ETH, blue chips are flat. Tokens, Ryan, up bigly. We'll talk about that later in the show. But tokens wait, are Wait, wait, wait. Tokens, tokens like move. DeFi tokens? DeFi tokens, yeah. They're on the move? Yeah, they're on the move. Uh, uh, well, we will cover that in what it, I am bullish on at the very end of the podcast. Is it time to bring our DPI chart back? <laughs> oh, God. I'm not toast. I'm not ready for that. <laughs> <laughs> not not Just quite specific that bullish. tokens, please. <laughs> How about uh, global cryptocurrency market cap? Are we at a trillion yet? We're yeah, no, trillion, yeah right? we've been at a trillion for a while. We a- yeah. ended last week at 1.14 trillion. We are at 1.11 trillion. Um, so down $30 billion again. Less, if it's less than one Terra of downwards, that's flat. That's less flat. than one Terra. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Too soon, David. Um, <laughs> gas markets. Gas so markets. Gas markets in real life kind of suck. Price mm-hmm. at the pump. But mm-hmm. price at the Ethereum pump, still kind of good. Is Super this cheap. nine Gwei Super this week? Cheap. Did it hit yeah. as low as Gwe, nine Gwei? Yeah. You can, you can scroll down to get, to get that chart a little bit. Yeah. So last week it was keep going down. Got it. Every single time you miss this. There we go. Okay. Green, Where green chart. Green chart and green. Top oh. right. Yeah, so the 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 average. Well, we'll start here. the The average total transaction gas distribution, the peak, was at nine guay this week, down one guay from last week. Seven, Ryan, is the number we gotta beat to be deflationary in the merge, and we are at nine. <laughs> That's too close for comfort. Yeah. All right, I can That would be so disappointing. But let's take a look at Bitcoin and ETH from all time high. Uh, perspective. Bitcoin down 65% from all-time high this week. ETH down 64%. And the difference between ETH and Bitcoin from their respective bottoms is ETH is up 76% from its bottom, and Bitcoin is only up 26%. So uh, ETH took a harder crash, harder dip than Bitcoin, but it has recovered mm-hmm. much faster. Yeah. And now it's kind of neck and neck on the, the percent down from all time high. What do you make of this? Yeah, I mean, this is definitely the merge trade. Like, I, I, it's very infrequently that I feel like we can confidently say what is make, m- making the market do the things that it's doing. But right now, I have some of the most confidence I've ever had that this is the merge trade. This is what this is. This is yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Merge, merge is bullish. Um, let's look at the other uh, percentage tokens down from all-time high. So besides Bitcoin and ETH, how about um, Binance Chain? What's that looking like? Yeah, Binance Chain, BNB always does very, very well. And and honestly, one of the reasons is because it's one of the few tokens that actually has cash flows embedded in it. Like it's kind of got this like manual EIP 1559 buyback and burn because uh, that's what Binance does with it, with its revenues. It buys BNB and burn so it. It's a massive exchange, which yeah. is a cash cow in bull yeah. markets and bear markets. It's still a cash cow and that's still sort of backing the, the yeah. Binance Chain. It always has or sorry, yeah, so BNB chain. BNB chain, yeah. So it's it's down 56% compared to Bitcoin and Ether's down 66%. So definitely better than those two. XRP down 88%. Cardano down 83%. Solana down 85%. Polkadot down 85%. Dogecoin down 91%. Uh, Polygon down 69%. Nice. Avalanche down 84%. Uniswap only down 28%. Wow, Uni only down 28%. That's pretty good. That's pretty so, good. I got to admit, David, I look at this chart and I see a little bit like nature's healing. Yeah, a little I bit. mean, this makes more sense to me mm-hmm. than the bull market. Um, it doesn't make complete sense to me, but like it's still <laughs> more reasonable than things in the bull market. Um, let's talk a little bit more about uh, the bullish ETH narrative. It's kind of going mainstream. You know Joe Weisenthal, right, from Bloomberg? Mm-hmm. Big time, yeah, yeah. He uh, has a podcast I listen to occasionally. He also has a, a newsletter. And in his newsletter this week, Joe Weisenthal, 
who's never really been an eth bull at any point in time Mm-mm. any of my reading of, of of his he just wrote why eth is taking over the narrative and why bitcoin's narrative is busted and um yeah i i think this is starting to escape into mainstream yeah. is probably the the takeaway here that eth like surpassing Bitcoin on the narrative front is a is a is a real thing that's happening right now. Yeah, and there there's two reasons for this. I think if you're inside of the crypto industry, you are bullish ETH. Or if if you are bullish ETH over Bitcoin, then it's because of Ether being deflationary post merge. But if you're outside of the crypto industry, you think that Ethereum is going to be in a better place than Bitcoin because of the ESG, like green energy narrative. Um, so, like, it's kind of pick pick your reason. But we got two of them as to why people uh, are trending in favor of, of ETH lately. Ryan, really quickly, I just talked about how Uniswap was only down like twenty eight percent, twenty nine percent. That didn't feel right. It's actually down seventy. It's not, it's down eighty percent. I just checked on yeah, on that was weird. View. Yeah, it, it's so actually down eighty percent. Uh, the Masari chart is that I don't know here? Where, where that came from. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. Thanks for that correction. Yeah. Um, yeah. But but to your point, and the two reasons to be bullish when you're inside of the space, you're kind of bullish because of the um, the, the structural sell pressure right. that just decreases in a. In my mind, the correct reason for being bullish. I think so. Yeah. I mean, like the narrative. We, I mean, the narrative side. We knew proof of stake. We knew proof of work was going away and Ethereum was becoming ESG is like for, kind of right. forever. Right. But I think this is less well known, but this has a greater, more, more immediate impact. What right. is the chart that we're looking at on the change in theoretical annual structural sell pressure with the massive issuance reduction? All of the proof of work issuance is like 4.1%, something like this. It goes away completely the mm-hmm. day of the merge. What are we looking at in this chart? Yeah, so we are looking at a bar chart that's titled Reduction in Theoretical Annual Structural Cell Pressure. And what, what that means is that some chains, uh, some, some bigger chains, have gone through changes in monetary policy throughout their history. Uh, Ether, Ether used to be issued five Ether per block at Genesis. That got reduced down to three in 2017. That, and then it got reduced down to two in 2019 to where it is now. Um, other, other blockchains have also done similar things like the Bitcoin happening famously. There was a 2016 Bitcoin happening, a 2020 Bitcoin happening. And the sizes of these bars are a function of how much sell pressure is getting reduced. So when Bitcoin goes through a happening, you take how much Bitcoin would have been issued in a year, multiply that by the USD price, uh, and then and then take away like how much how much is not being issued as a result of the happening. Uh, and so uh, the the 2020 Bitcoin happening reduced three billion dollars in theoretical annual sell pressure that got reduced from the happening. Uh, the ether. Uh, reduction from three ETH to two ETH in the proof of mining, uh, proof of work mining reward in 2019 re- removed 500 million in yearly annual sell pressure. But reminder, that's when Ether was like one, one or two hundred dollars. And so, if you multiply that by ten or twenty to where get where we are now, that's that would that would control for that. On the very far left, we have two upcoming changes. We have the Bitcoin uh, happening in 2024. Which, if you, again, multiply the n- amount of Bitcoin being issued versus its current price, where it is now at $23,000, you will, Bitcoin will receive a, almost a $4 billion reduction in annual sell pressure. This is why Bitcoiners like, love, love the happening, right? We reduce sell pressure. This is why the happening celebrated like scarcity coming in. And it's uh, scheduled every four scheduled. years. You it's know scheduled. it's coming. Right. And, and then in the ETH merge, the ETH merge, uh, which is upcoming very, very quickly, uh, is going to be a theoretical reduction in $7.5 billion of annual sell pressure. And so almost double the annual reduction in annual sell pressure for, from uh, ETH to, to Bitcoin, which is also saying something when it's, when it's double a reduction in US dollar sell pressure. But the difference in market cap between Bitcoin and Ethereum is about 2.5x. So the Bitcoin uh, market cap is is 440 billion. The Ethereum market cap is 195 billion. Call it, call it 200. Uh, and so the Bitcoin uh, market cap is 2.5 times larger than Ethereum's, but the Ethereum US dollar sell pressure reduction is twice as big as Bitcoin's. And so this is why, like this, this is so incredibly bullish. It's such an outsized reduction in sell pressure versus the much smaller Ethereum market cap. Yeah, another way to say this too is po- in a post-merge world, um, Ethereum is going to have to find, in order to stay flat, in order for prices not to explode upwards, Ethereum is going to have to find $7.5 billion in new sellers. Right. 
And if it doesn't won't, find those new sellers... Won't be finding it here, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> if it doesn't find those new sellers, it has no choice but to go it's, up. It has no choice but to go That's up. That's why the, the economics of the merge <laughs> are so interesting and so attractive. And I think why the market is, is starting maybe to price this in, though I don't mm-hmm. think they fully priced it in. Um, you know, of course, we'll see what happens. The merge is literally like, checkmate sellers. <laughs> I just don't... Why would you sell? There's like, there's two times you can, you can, uh, you know, buy or sell ETH, right? One is before the merge and, and the other is after, right? And mm-hmm. I, I'm definitely a buyer before the merge. I yeah. think it's a historic opportunity. Yeah. Anyway, not financial advice. Okay, but the second reason, the, the reason maybe mainstream thinks this is interesting as well, is the whole ESG narrative. So this is the energy reduction narrative when uh, Ethereum transitions to proof of stake and gets rid of all of the energy inefficient mining that happens. What tweet are we looking at here, David? Yeah, so we're looking looking at just a chart of Google searches for ESG over time. And it's like a hockey, it's just, uh, on the beginnings of a hockey stage, a uh, hockey stick, it looks like. Uh, where popularity of Google searches for ESG over time. I don't really know what this X axis is. Maybe it's arbitrary, um, but we are roughly three times higher than we were in 2020, if that is any sort of an indication. So we're extrapolating here and saying just like ESG as a concept, uh, which is just like, in, in sustainable investing, both in uh, in ecological standpoint, but also a, like a political and governance standpoint, uh, and so uh, Im- implying that ESG is in vogue, uh, and so a reduction in energy usage by a b- leading blockchain will be very a very popular move with people uh, because because ESG is in vogue. Now, personally, I don't really enjoy the ESG. I think it's just adding a political element to investing. Um, but that is just a political take, I guess. Like I think, I think there's better ways to, uh, optimize for investments, but it's what the pop is what the people want and the people want things that are green. And that's what Ethereum is doing when it goes to the merge. You definitely have to track it as a narrative. And the yeah. bottom line here, as the tweet said, is Bitcoin has decided to ignore the ESG issue right. entirely. Whereas Ethereum is unlatching itself from proof of work. And that's the narrative going forward. And I think people are uh, are buying into that narrative as well. Mm-hmm. David, people are also buying into ENS. Uh, we just got the July 2022 stats. And ENS is an NFT that just is doing very well mm-hmm. in this bear market. What are we looking at for the high-level stats here? Yeah, let's go through some of the numbers. 378,000 new .eth registrations, bringing the new total to 1.86 million ENS names that have been minted. Uh, that's $6.8 million in protocol revenue going to the DAO. That's 5,400 5, ETH in revenue. Uh, with 48,000 new ETH accounts, new Ethereum addresses that have at least one ENS name in it. Uh, and greater, and I never have understood this last metric, greater than 99% of OpenSea domain volume. Does that mean ENS is, is dominating, dominating OpenSea volume by 99%? No, no, just domains. There are other domains besides .eths and ENS. There are .dot cryptos. There are all sorts uh, of other .dot Okay. Names, oh, like, so it's market share. Like ENS yeah, it's owns just market that. Well, that, share. that makes sense. I mean, yeah, like market, the domain space is like a monopoly game, so that makes sense. ENS definitely has won that won that game. It's kind of feeling like it's the .dot com, right? At yes. least. Yes. Uh, yeah. This is uh, this is really interesting, and all of that protocol revenue goes to the DAO. Yeah. Six point eight million protocol revenue. That was six point eight million for the month. Just one for the month? month. For the month. Yeah. What? Yeah. That's right. a cash cow. Right. And like, I, I can't imagine the DAO has all that many expenses. <laughs> okay. What is the what is the um, token you're going, price you're of, going to... of ENS? Uh, that's a good question. How's that doing? Uh, remember the ENS token? You got some airdrop. A lot of people. Yeah, which drops. I couldn't claim because my Argent wallet lost my private keys. My Argent still wallet. Pretty, it's 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 uh, off the bottoms here. Yeah, it's off it's the still, bottoms. It's sure. still climbing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Bottom around I, I, nine. I, I, the ENS is a is a good buy. It is a good buy. It's double from the bottom. Yeah, but I mean, if you put if you go to cryptofees.info uh, for just talking about the DApps, uh, Uniswap one point five million dollars in revenue in one day. Ave point uh, six million dollars of revenue in one day. GMX, one day. which is uh, 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 an app that's spitting out ETH to its token holders, point two million. Sushi Swap one point point one six million. ENS coming in in one two three four coming in fifth at one point one five million dollars per day. One hundred fifty thousand dollars per day in revenue. Uh, still three times more than Solana. <laughs> I don't yeah, know but, what to but say about that. It's not a fair comparison because <laughs> Solana is like explicitly like. We won't collect any fees. We will not have economic sustainability. And that's how we'll just like onboard everyone by collecting zero money. Yes. But I think it's 
a, more of a fair comparison than people actually think. Um, yes, it should. We it, actually people should this, think this. Yes, <laughs> we actually get into this conversation with. Um, I was going to say Polynia. 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 Yeah. So David and I um, did an Anon interview with Polynia last mm-hmm. week. We talked a lot about previously known fees. as uh, the Anon previously known as Polynia. It turns <laughs> out we, pr- we have not been pronouncing that name correctly at all. Anyway, it's uh, it's not coming out this Monday, but the mm-hmm. next Monday we talk all about alternative layer ones versus Ethereum and layer twos and where the value accrual is going to lie. And uh, anyway, the, I don't miss that episode is all I'm mm-hmm. saying. We, we get into this discussion around uh, fees and how it impacts valuation. Uh, David, what else we got here? Speaking of ENS names, OpenSea bought OpenSea.eth for $165,000. Uh, wow. Yeah, so uh, n- nice payday for whoever minted OpenSea.eth. Congratulations. Oh, that's uh, basically 100 ETH. Well done. I'm glad we got bankless.eth uh, back in the day, David. Yeah. Before this. Yeah. Before Could you this imagine how much we'd be gouged if we hadn't gotten oh, bankless.eth? It'd be so sad. I don't know yeah. if I'd do it. What would we pay for that? We'd pay like $2,000 for that? Like, goodbye. We paid Goodbye. ETH for it. So I, you have to uh, translate that into ETH terms. Uh, maybe maybe uh, it's worse than that. <laughs> Who knows? But ETH is uh, down. I don't know. No, we're probably I'm, okay. I'm going to go. I'm going to go. What do, I'm going to go find this out right now. Ryan, we bought bankless.eth August 2nd, 2020 for wow. 5.15 ETH. That's, that's more, that's that's more than $2,000. It's sad. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's very steep. What steep. is that? Uh, right ETH? now, yeah, that's like uh, $8,000. Yeah, 5.15. Yeah, you know, under 10,000. 8,250, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's still cool. over the long term. But yeah, over the long run. I mean, we would have paid we would have had to pay a lot more for it oh, now. An egregious amount. An egregious and by the amount. way, we caught this when it um, somebody let it expire. So somebody had purchased it and they let it expire. We came in and sniped it in the bid process. Wait, how did we it for a while. If it expired, why did we pay 5.15 ETH? Uh, there a, because a, bid, a bidding war? there was like this, there was like this bid process that they had in place with some expired domains where it started uh-huh. very steep, and then over the next thirty days, like it descended in price. Oh, and but like anyone we, could buy it. Anyone could buy it, but like oh, we yeah. bought it right away. Oh yeah, yeah. That so we bought it at kind yeah, of at the worth, top worth, of that because worth, not taking worth. the risk. Yeah. Anyway, guys, uh, coming up next, we're going to talk more about the hack season that seems to be happening. It's sort of a bad week for hacks across yeah. crypto, especially if you are using the bridges to some of these other ecosystems, a $200 million hack, and then this Solana private key hack. We're going to talk about that. And then also, David, you're going to tell us whether proof of work ETH, a fork of Ethereum, if that's a real thing or fake news. Yeah. And uh, I'm still hoping for my ETH forked tokens that I could sell for more ETH. Don't but, hold uh, your breath. <laughs> we'll see. Guys, we'll be right back. But before we do, we want to thank the sponsors that made this episode possible. MakerDAO is the OG DeFi protocol, the first DeFi protocol to ever exist, even before we called it DeFi. MakerDAO produces DAI, the industry's most battle-tested and resilient stablecoin. Using Maker, you don't need to sell your collateral if you need liquidity. Instead, you can spin up a Maker vault and use your collateral to mint DAI directly. With Maker, the power to mint new money is in your hands. And there's something new in the MakerDAO ecosystem. Every time a new Maker vault is opened, the owner can claim a POAP, which contributes funds to One Tree Planted, an organization with ongoing global reforestation efforts, creating a world where digital participation and the health of our environment can live side by side. Soon, Maker will be present on all chains in Layer 2s, bringing the biggest and best DeFi credit facility to everywhere there is DeFi. Today, you can mint DAI on Oasis.app, DeFi Saver, or other DeFi protocols that you use. So follow Maker on Twitter, at MakerDAO, and learn from the oldest and most resilient DAO in existence. Rocket Pool is your friendly, decentralized Ethereum staking protocol. You can stake your ETH with Rocket Pool and get our ETH in return, allowing you to stake your ETH and use it in DeFi at the same time. You can get 4% on your ETH by staking it with Rocket Pool, but you can get even more by running a node. Rocket Pool is the only staking provider that allows anyone to permissionlessly join their network of validating nodes. Running a Rocket Pool node is easier to set up than running a solo node, and you only need 16 ETH to get started. Why would you do this? You get an extra 15% staking commission on the pooled ETH, so your APY is boosted. So if you're bullish ETH staking, you can increase your APY and get some extra tokens by adding your node to the decentralized Rocket Pool network, which currently has over a thousand independent validators. It's yield farming, but with Ethereum nodes. You can get started at rocketpool.net and also join the Rocket Pool community in their Discord. You can find me hanging out there sometimes in the chat, so I'll see you there. All right, guys, we are back with another big bridge hack. This time, a bridge called Nomad was drained of nearly $200 million in an exploit. This was a code-type exploit, so a technical exploit. David, you want to tell us what happened? 
Yeah, so uh, cross-chain bridge, Nomad, it goes to a number of different ecosystems, Avalanche, Ethereum, EV, EV, EVMOS, EVMOS. Uh, Cosmos chain Cosmos, yeah. EVM, yeah. Right. Uh, Milkomeda and Moonbeam. Uh, and so, there, like you said, it was a smart contract exploit as opposed to like an economic or Oracle attack. Uh, we lost almost $200 million. Uh, and the person that really unpacked this uh, the best is a, a Sam C. Sun who put a thread together. Uh, and so we'll, we'll go ahead and read out the thread because it's not, it's not too long. So uh, Sam says, Nomad just got drained for over $150 million in one of the most chaotic hacks that Web3 has ever seen. How did this happen exactly and what was the root cause? Allow me to take you behind the scenes. Please do, Sam. Uh, and so he says, it all started when uh, a, somebody, a Twitter, a Telegram account shared another Telegram account's, uh, Twitter account's tweet in an Ethereum security Telegram channel. Although I had no idea what was going on at the time, the sheer volume of assets leaving the bridge was clearly a bad sign. And he shows a tweet of 100 WBTC leaving the Nomad Bridge uh, like transaction after transaction after transaction. So 100 WBTC, 100 WBTC. Uh, and somebody says, Nomad Bridge getting rugged looks very, very sus. Uh, Sam says, my first thought was that there was some misconfiguration for the token's decimals. After all, it seemed that the bridge was, was running a send 0.01 WBTC, get 100 WBTC back promotion. And then he, here he's showing a tweet where somebody was sending in literally 0.01 BTC, but hundreds of BT WBTC were going out. <laughs> That's a bad promotion to run. It's, bad, it's a bad promotion, anyway. yeah. Uh, Sam says, uh, however, after some painful manual digging on the Moonbeam network, I confirmed that while the Moonbeam transaction did bridge out 0 0.01 BTC, somehow the Ethereum transaction bridged in WBTC. Uh, further, the transaction bridge in the WBTC didn't actually prove anything. It's simply called process, uh, like a function process directly. Suffice to say, being able to me process a message without proving it first is extremely not good. Uh, and so what, what they mean is like, by proving it is that this is a, if there's a thing called a prover. Maybe this is what we're, we're talking about. But basically, like anybody can send a message to a bridge, but the message needs to be correct. Uh, and that's part of like the functionality of the bridge. Uh, at this point, there were two possibilities. Either the proof had been submitted separately in an earlier block, or there was something extremely wrong in the replica contract. However, there was no absolutely no indication that anything had been proven recently. Again, this is like terminology about like how do, like uh, uh, contracts need to be uh, receiving messages about that are correct. Uh, to whatever degree that the smart contract in that bridge deems something correct, it's like kind of up to how the bridge is constructed. But a correct message would be something that is like coming from one one chain to another, uh, and like a proof is generated that is correct or so. Um, Sam continues and says, "There's only one possibility left. There was a fatal flaw in the replica replica contract, but how?" A quick look suggests that the message submitted must belong to an acceptable root. Otherwise, the check on line 185 would fail. Fortunately, there is an easy way to sanity check this assumption. I knew that the root of the message, which had not been proven, would be 0x00 because message brackets underscore message hash bracket would be uninitialized. All I had to do was check whether the contract would accept that as a root. Uh, and then the next one is uh, oops. That's the only thing the tweet says. It says oops. And basically, Sam just put in 0x00000000 as an address and it comes back true, meaning that every single thing will come back true, meaning that like the bridge is like an open vault. Everything is true. Uh, the contract returns everything true. Uh, and so, so that means anyone could go anyone call that can function and yes. pull funds out. More or less, yeah. Of the bridge. Yeah. Uh, and so Sam says, it turns out during a routine upgrade that the Nomad team initialized the trusted root to be 0x000. To be clear, using zero values as an initialization values is a common practice. Unfortunately, in this case, it had the tiny side effect of auto-proving every message. Oh so every God. message, every possible message was approved. As in like, hey, can you send me 100 WPTC? Approved. Approved. Uh, and so uh, Sam says and finishes, this is why the hack was so chaotic. You didn't need to know about Solidity or Merkle trees or anything like that. All you had to do was find a transaction that worked, find and replace the other person's address with yours, and then rebroadcast it. So not every single transaction works. But you have to have a certain hash. But it's just you need to find a transaction that starts with 0x00. And you can go find that by going to a previous bridge transaction and then copying that transaction and just replacing it with your outbound address and then sending that. Uh, and so TLDR, a routine upgrade marked the zero hash as a valid route, which uh, had the effect of allowing messages to be spoofed on Nomad. Attackers abused this to copy and paste transactions and quickly drained the bridge in a frenzied free-for-all. So once one person realized it, everyone realized it, that there, the, the gates to the vault were open. 
there was an open vault and all the money was just like sitting there. Well, Somebody realized it. And then as soon as one person realized it, everyone realized it. That's the analogy, right? So right. The, this Nomad Bridge had code that essentially uh, vaulted off massive mm-hmm. amounts of money, hundreds of millions of dollars uh, in value here. So like mm-hmm. close to $200 million. And then they issued a update to this vault mm-hmm. and the door swung wide open yeah. and they didn't even realize it. Right. And then, you know, no one people... realized it for 43 days. So this vault has been open for 43 days in a row. Wow. It's only, only a, like uh, two day, two or three days ago that somebody was like, hey, there's money there. There's, and there's money no there. no one stopping me from and, going and getting it. And so they went and the, the, the first couple people grabbed the money. Yeah. And then an entire crowd assembled yeah. to go pick up the money yeah. from the vault and like, you know, stuff it under their, their trench coats and run mm-hmm. home with it. Yep. Wow. Mm -hmm. Uh, Are these white hats, David? (laughs) Yeah. So, I mean, so not everyone who's doing this is evil, of course. There are a number of people that just went and grabbed the money because if they didn't grab the money, then somebody malicious would grab the money. So, like, if you're a a person saying, well, that money's free, everyone's taking it, I'll be a good person and I'll take the money and I'll return it. Before someone else does? Before uh, an evildoer does it. And so, like, it's kind of like a little bit like game theory. If you know that you are going to return the money, then you can safely go get the money and return it to the people later. So, somebody who... uh, made a transaction to go get this money and knew what they were doing they they write in the message field in their transaction saying i'm returning this money fbi please calm down no i didn't plan to seal it and yes i know this address is doxed. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing just leaving a message for the it's fbi just like, like, my hands are up my hands are up like don't shoot don't shoot um david did you <laughs> here, here, see this that, that was a super funny tweet where somebody says accidentally exploited the nomad bridge for seventeen thousand dollars will return the funds asap <laughs> Did you see this clip of like the monkeys? Yeah. So, so this is a tweet from a Haska trade saying the nomad hack explained. And here's just like a, a plastic bin of a bunch of bread. And then there's like a hundred monkeys coming in. They're all grabbing the bread out of the basket. I mean, this is uh this is kind of, you know, of the $190 million, uh, apparently 9 million mm-hmm. has been returned. So there's $9 million worth of, of white hacks that are mm-hmm. actually doing the right thing and re- returning these funds. Yeah. But that's quite a gap, man. That's like 180 yeah, that's a, million that's a, that has not been returned. It was that five, 5% at, it was captured by white ha- hackers. Yes. So it's not, it's not zero. I mean, the big question zero. is, do you remember the wormhole hack that happened? Man, it feel, right. feels like another lifetime mm-hmm. ago, but it honestly, it wasn't that long ago, but that got a bailout right. from Jump Capital. Yeah. The question wasn't that, is- was that a billion dollar bailout? Well, yes, uh, something yeah. like that. It was a yeah. lot of money. Uh, I can't remember it. I don't know if it was quite a billion, but um, I don't know if the deep pockets are coming to rescue the bridge this time. Right. What do you think? Right. Well, there's also a lot less money in the ecosystem now. Um, $320 million is what it was. Um, $320 million. Yeah. So, so yeah. this is I a mean, pretty big it, one. It, plenty of people have hundreds of millions of dollars in the top of the market. Fewer people have hundreds of millions of dollars in this current state of the market. I mean, I think Nomad has recently been, uh, been funded as well by VC. So, yeah. you know, so yeah, but not for 190 million. They they raised like 22 million. Not even close, not yeah. even close. Yeah. So what are you going to do? That's their, What's like, going to happen? Money. They have to pay employees with that. What's also interesting is, uh, this was a bridge to many kind of, of the like alternative layer one ecosystem. So mm-hmm. as you said, uh, Avalanche, the Cosmos, uh, um, Milk Amida. Milk Amida. Milk- Milk Amida is... Um, That's Cardano. It's Cardo- uh, Cardano. And what's Moonbeam? You know what Moonbeam is? Moonbeam. I do not know what Moonbeam is. Yeah, neither do I. Um, I so what do you think a, this means? a very powerful uh, dragon, fl- fly, a dragon type attack from Pokemon. <laughs> really? Okay. Your Pokemon lore exceeds mine, my friend. <laughs> um, all right. It's a, po- so, a Pokedot platform. The question is, it's Pokedot? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so it's not Pokemon. <laughs> Nothing to do with Pokemon. Um... So the question is, are all bridge all are all bridges susceptible to this? Yes, so yeah. you know, like Banklets, we're very excited about um, layer twos, obviously. Yes, uh, Optimism, which also, have, also have bridges. Yep. Arbitrum, the zk EVMs. You've heard us talk about these before, and they also have bridges. To David's mm-hmm. point, these yep. bridges are not susceptible to economic attack, which is one category of attack, and probably less susceptible to Oracle attack. We haven't yeah. got delved into that in all the details, but is susceptible to this to similar kinds of technical attack yeah. as we saw with Nomad. So yeah. does that worry you uh, that like, hey, anytime we bridge from mainnet Ethereum, there's some 
smart contract riskier on any of these layer two ecosystems? Do you think that'll be an inhibitor to scale? Yeah. So uh, layer two, layer twos are bridges that have less attack surface area. Like you said, there are, you can't do an economic attack on a layer two bridge. Uh, and you also cannot do an Oracle attack on a layer two bridge if, if that bridge has an Oracle. But you know, smart contracts are smart contracts and bridges are smart contracts. And so a layer two bridge to Optimism, ZK Sync, you know, Arbitrum, these are all have bridges that all have smart contracts that, and those smart contracts can be exploited. Um, there is one major difference for optimistic rollups in that optimistic rollups have a seven day withdrawal window. And so if you have a bunch of ether on Optimism or Arbitrum and then you, and then you like exploit that bridge, it's gonna take you seven days to get back to the Ethereum layer one. But that's, I guess that's only true if that uh, smart contract exploit happens on the, on the layer two side, because that ether does exist on the Ethereum layer one inside the bridge contract. So if the Ethereum layer one bridge contract is exploited, I guess you could just get it out immediately. Um, so smart contract risk is always going to be smart contract risk. The, the spicy hot take that I'll have is that if you are building a layer two on Ethereum, one of the core reasons why you would choose to do a layer two on Ethereum rather than alternative layer one is that you believe in, you prioritize security up, up most. Like if you are doing your own blockchain, your own layer one blockchain, you have to build your security from scratch and you're going to be inherently less secure than the Ethereum layer one because uh, that's what the Ethereum layer one has optimized for. So if you are a layer two, you are prioritizing security that is in your culture as a team. So if you are a team that prioritizes culture, uh, security in your culture, you're likely also doing a much higher effort on securing your bridge and your bridge smart contracts than you would if you are a team that doesn't prioritize security as much. And teams that don't prioritize security don't build rollups, they build alternative layer ones. Is that a fair take? I feel like that's a fair take. I, I, I think that's a fair take, but, but also at the same time, I mean, it's nice to say, right? But like, I don't know, it's kind of verify don't trust. Sure. It's, it's not great to be in the position of having to trust the expertise and the skill level and the security um, like, um, the security profile of, of devs of a particular bridge. Um, so yeah, I would say I am moderately worried about this and it's not something that, um, we should take lightly. Like mm -hmm. the good, the good news, I think with, with all of these, um, you know, bridges in the rollup ecosystem is they're upgradable. So we haven't like turned off we, we haven't removed the upgrade button from any of them. So if something goes wrong, you know, a patch could, could go in quickly. But yeah, I think there is some risk. And um, we should be real about that when people are bridging to even layer two ecosystems, uh, mm -hmm. they have this risk. Now, I think that risk will decrease massively over time. There was a time, David, where I, I was too freaked out to put any funds inside of a multisig, yeah. like the Gnosis multisig wallet, for, for instance. Right. And right. do you remember... There was a Gnosis multi-sig wallet, kind of a V1, and then they they created a V2, and you sort of reset the clock back to zero when mm -hmm. a new upgrade is kind of issued. And now I'm not like right. the Gnosis multi-sig uh, holds you know tens of billions of dollars at this point. It's been around for years, has mm -hmm. a very strong Lindy, and I think the only way around kind of um, the the bridge hack concern is you have to have bridges that have been in place without being touched for a long period of time, securing massive amounts of money. And this is going to take time. So mm. I don't know, I, I'm not putting all of my funds on a layer two as a result of this because mm -hmm. it's still in the early phases. Uh, do you think yeah. that's a fair take? I, I definitely think that's a fair take. And just to, to, I think we should definitely take some time on this on this topic because Bridges is, you know, always has been a, a huge theme of the last twelve months. This is a Bartex thread from Layer Two Beat. Uh, Layer Two Beat is doing a, a fantastic job just putting in risk frameworks and helping to define the risks of bridges and Layer Twos. So Bartek puts this thread together and he says, "With the recent hack of Nomad, I think it's time to reflect more broadly on bridge security. As ne by now they have become far more." The most critical piece of blockchain infrastructure. Here are some things to consider. Externally validated bridges, as in bridges that require a kind of multi-sig to pr uh, process messages, can obviously be drained by the key owners and the keys might be compromised, but the smart contract there is very simple simple to implement, audit, and independently verify. As in, you're trading, you're, there's a trade-off here. Your smart contract is more simple because you've 
uh, exported a bunch of risk to the multi-sig. And sometimes, especially in the beginning stages of a bridge, I would definitely op advocate for this model. Let's just like, like remove all the complexity and just trust the founders, trust the multi-sig for the beginning stage. This, can, this is similar to the Polygon bridge, to the proof yes, of stake uh, yes. chain. Grant, granted, Polygon has an extra layer of defense because it has Ethereum side Matic staking, which is a very meaningful difference than like your typical side chain or cross layer one bridge. Um, uh, Bartek uh, continues and says, there is downside, of course. With that bridge, you need to trust the off-chain code, which is completely opaque. Who knows what's going on there? Shout out Ronin, Ronin uh, bridge with the Axie network. Um, Bartek says, Nomad is way more complex, and it fell due to an obscure bug in a smart contract code, not an architectural flaw. Compared to Nomad, optimistic rollups are still more complex. Compared to optimistic rollups, ZK rollups are insanely complex. You do the math. It makes sense to let the bridge code ossify with time before you move bigger funds. But after the upgrade, the ossification timer is reset to zero yes. as the upgrade may in introduce a critical bug as it happened with Nomad. This is this mm. is what happened. They upgraded their bridge contract. It was and, fine previously. And, right. And so, yeah, it was, it was fine. And they're like, okay, cool. Let's let's up the security. Let's up the uh, hands-off nature of this, this bridge. And that upgrade was the thing that introduced the risk. Whoops. Um, Bartek says, Nomad is also permissionless. Anyone could process messages and bridge. The bridge cannot be stopped. No central actor to trust. Which, like, yay, we like that in a bankless world, but also, ooh, scary in the early days. Um, this removed power from Nomad team, but also left them helpless watching the bridge being drained. Ouch. As noted many times before, this space critically needs a solution for design that is trustless and secure against critical bugs at the same time. Seven-day delay windows in optimistic rollups gives an honest actor, an on honest operator, plenty of time to stop withdrawals hence it makes sense virtually impossible hence it makes it virtually impossible for an attacker to exploit the bug in a smart contract uh, uh, so the operator could pause things operator could pause things and i actually think that that actually does protect against ether deposits on the layer one from being revoked or like exploited from the bridge contract because that contract has a seven day window on it on the ethereum yeah, totally side. I that that, so. that actually yeah. makes me feel better about yes, optimistic certainly. roll ups. Yeah. Um, therefore, it may be. And so, the, the, what he's saying here is there, there's a balance here with like the seven day window. We can make things trustless and smart contract based without it being a multi sig. But you see, but you also have like the if if uh, it comes down to it, like an operator can step in and do something inside of that seven days. Same, Famously, same this the, is what saved Ethereum during the DAO hack. Right, and same with the upgrade ability. While that is mm -hmm. like a knock against, you know, it's more centralized for a optimistic rollup team to have upgrade ability. Mm -hmm. the, the fact that they have that sort of makes the funds more secure if you you know have some trust in them to be an honest actor. Yeah. Uh, last few tweets from Bartek. Uh, Hence, it makes it virtually impossible for an attacker to exploit the bug in a smart contract because of that seven day window. ZK rollups, if they contained a bug, might not be so lucky as there is no delay window there. Fun fact about ZK rollups, you can go in and out of ZK rollups instantaneously, but then you lose that seven day window protection. Um, Bartek continues and says, therefore, it may be good to have a delay for big withdrawals and a cap on fast withdrawals to limit the potential damage. This is the approach that MakerDAO is taking with its teleport for canonical multi-chain die. Um, they're making MakerDAO's making wormholes for dies across layer twos. Uh, so this is relevant there. Bartek says, if the fast withdrawal infrastructure is breached, MakerDAO, not die users, will take the loss, but up to a predefined limit. It's a risk that the DAO may be willing to take. The risk is no different than issuing a bad loan. If this is one bad loan out of a thousand good loans, this is okay. You can be even more fancy and have more complex risk framework taking advantage of architectural properties of a given layer two to which you want to bridge to. Check out this proposal if you want to dive deeper. Uh, and then last last couple tweets. Uh, one prominent project that limits deposits is Starknet. Openly admitting to still being alpha is one thing, but users typically ignore that. Deposit limits keep Starknet's TVL artificially low, but this is good and responsible. We still need to look for the per perfect bridge design and the cost of mistakes for the whole space is massive. In the meantime, users should be reasonable with how much funds they are moving out from the base layer. I just want to go back to my culture statement. Bart Bartek, previous at MakerDAO, which... Uh, which is one of the DAOs that has been optimized for security since before this whole like multi-chain like world. Like MakerDAO has been so risk focused in its culture. And so like that has now extended to Bartek and what they're doing at layer two B and all their uh, risk frameworks for layer twos. And now all these layer twos are like, uh, uh, also focusing on like the layer two beat risk framework coming from this very conservative layer two beat team that's optimized for security the most. 
I will ask you if you are a, if you consider yourself a citizen to be uh, a citizen of a different chain layer one chain whether it's Avalanche Solana like you know pick your chain is there a culture of security in those chains that it resembles the culture of security that happens on Ethereum? Because this is the thing that has saved Ethereum from all of these bridges, uh, from all of these exploits that you see happening elsewhere. There's a reason why so much exploits is happening external to Ethereum. Only the paranoid Ethereum, survive. Only the paranoid survive. That's a great way to put it. Uh, so this culture of uh, this culture of security is why is why so fewer exploits happen inside of the Ethereum ecosystem. But also knock on wood there, David. Oh, you I, know can, what we'll I mean? gladly knock on wood. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we can also, we can also uh, compartmentalize out parts of the Ethereum app layer, like Wonderland, for example. Uh, very risk-taking. There's many DeFi apps on Ethereum that are very, very not risk-adverse. But that's different. It's different from being risk-averse on the app layer versus risk-averse on the protocol layer. You definitely want to um, pri prioritize projects that... Um, or you, you definitely want to lean into projects that prioritize security over, over mm -hmm. speed. Right, yes. in this case. And there are many shortcuts you Kyle. can make on the speed <laughs> front of things, Mr. Kyle Samani. But um, we're dealing with a lot of money. Th this reminds me to what we always you know, end bankless with, which this is the frontier. You could lose what you put in. It's not right. for everyone. The frontier has kind of moved from mainnet Ethereum into the mm -hmm. layer two space yeah. and, and into, the, space, yeah. Yeah, into the sidechain space. So now in order to bridge funds to a sidechain, you know what, David? I need to receive a bit more return on my yeah. investment because it's yeah. a bit more risky over there than on mainnet. So these are all considerations as, as you're thinking about your journey, your bankless journey and your journey into crypto. Yeah. I'm confident though, over time, these you know, kind of like technical challenges, the code will become trusted, cemented, ossified, and that's really gonna save us, kind of similar to a Gnosis safe. I was mm -hmm. skeptical of that in the early days. Now I'm not, like mm -hmm. I'm fine putting you know, a lot into inside of Gnosis safe. Um, but I do think, this is back to kind of a, a sad prediction that uh, we made, Bankless made, at the beginning of 2022, that there will be more of these monster bridge hacks. Uh, so this is what we said. There will be some monster bridge hacks in 2022, we're starting to see them, that will make question, people question their multi-L1 chain thesis. And here's also what I mean. Because over time, you can get rid of and reduce the risk, the technical risk and the code risk, but you cannot reduce the economic risk and the Oracle attack risk. Mm -hmm. Okay. And unless you're on a layer two, unless you're, you know, uh, um, doing some level of a roll up strategy in the side chain strategy, where we've got like, you know, networks of side chains, you will always have the economic risk of bridges. You will always have the Oracle attack risk of bridges and that ain't going away. And so, this is a reason why I am much more bullish on kind of the Ethereum roadmap uh, pooled security vision than on kind of like there will be many chains and like there's no real settlement platform of shared security between them. Uh, and because because there's just the bridge risk, people understate the bridge risk and events like this kind of highlight what a mistake it is to understate the bridge risk. Yeah. Uh, anything uh else on this story, David? Yeah, just to finally tie it off, like this industry is built on top of settlement assurances, which is basically property rights. Uh, are you uh, are you in a bankless paradigm where you own your own assets and no one can revoke those assets from you? Like that is what this industry is built on. Everything is built on strong settlement assurances, uh, and so. This is by the same way, is the same vogue that uh, the strongest, most secure layer one will always end up winning out. The most secure and strongest bridges will also be winning out. And this is why bridges that have the least amount of risk surface area will win over the bridges that have more surface area. And those bridges are always going to be roll up cryptographic bridges. There, there's your bridgecation cool. there. We, I, think, nice. I think we've covered nice. that thoroughly. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. Let's talk about the uh, mysterious Solana wallet hack, mm -hmm. too. That was Unrelated crazy. Unrelated to bridges, however. Unrelated yeah. to bridges, but it was crazy this week. It's suddenly, there's like 5,000 wallets, mm -hmm. uh, upwards, like maybe closer to 10,000 wallets. Basically, Solana wallets. Mm -hmm. People looked inside of their wallet, and they were like, oh, my God, my money is no longer there. How could this happen? Right. And I'm not talking about you know, centralized exchange wallets. I'm talking about sort of you have the private key to your wallet, in, you know, Phantom or some sort of, you know, MetaMask, for instance. And then all of a sudden, 
the fees are go- like the, right. the 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 funds are uh, withdrawn. Yep. How could yep. this even happen? Yeah, that and was I, the question. So like a lot of Solana users, for for those that don't use Solana, it's like they opened up their MetaMask and like there was no money there anymore. Yes, like it was all gone. It was all, it gone. Was all gone. And yeah. so, big question of how does this happen, uh, and how did it happen? Because there's kind of like a Sherlock Holmes, uh, yeah. you know, the entire community, Ethereum, Solana, the entire crypto community was trying to figure out how this mass wallet drain actually happened. Fortunately, not a lot of money, but yeah. um, it was like $6 million or something like this. But a lot mm-hmm. of wallets were affected. Right. You want to tell us the story here, David? Yeah, so here, here's the tweet thread. I'll just explain it better than I can. Uh, it says, $6 million of Sol and USDC have been stolen from over 8,000 Solana wallets. The hacker used private keys to drain user funds in what has been one of the craziest and most mysterious hacks in recent times. It all started when a few people noticed that some unusual outflows were happening from Phantom wallets on Solana. Phantom, I think, is the most popular wallet on Solana. Uh, numerous reports started to pop across Twitter and Discord of users having fun drains from their wallets. Phantom Wallet was quick to issue a statement saying that they do not believe that this is a phantom specific issue. Interesting, interesting. Uh, and so developer and auditor X Fubar uh, found, uh, Zero X Fubar found that the attacker was stealing both Sol and USD tokens from people's Slope and Phantom Wallet. Slope, another wallet in the Solana ecosystem. The most logical thing to do like this is to revoke any access to any dApps, as in like, you know, un- undo all permissions. But Avalanche co founder Emin asserted that it's likely that the attack ac- acquired access to private keys. How did they do that? How did they get the hands on 8,000 different private keys? Not supposed to happen. Not supposed to happen. Uh, and and so this means that the only way to protect your assets is to move them onto a hardware wallet or onto a centralized exchange. So this was a hot wallet exploit. Solana finally responded after hours of speculation that stated that over 7,767 wallets had been affected by the exploit so far. But what was soon uh, made matters worse was that RPC nodes started pinging as offline. This indicated that the Solana network was down, causing more panic across Twitter. It was theorized that the nodes were being uh, purposely DDoSed by developers in order to slow down the hackers. This backfired as it caused additional confusion. Oof. Uh, Supposedly, the DDoS attack was aimed at the hacker, which uh, subsequently resulted in an RPC nodes failing. Oh, God, what a mess. Uh, okay, keep going. Uh, the, the most concerning part of the, of the, is the lack of clarity surrounding the root cause of the issue. Even Solana co-founder Anatoly um, uh, couldn't offer ver- verdict despite, uh, despite alluding to iOS imported wallets being the key target. He and other key Solana figures surveyed their audience for data trying to get to down to the bottom of the exploit, almost uh, attempting to conduct an uh, on-the-go post-modem. This indicates to me that we are dealing with a highly complex exploit. As of now, the issue is still being uh, investigated. Solana's latest uh, update says that they continue to investigate the root cause, and it does not appear to be a bug within Solana core code. We do know the root cause, though, now. I think this tweet thread kind of trails off at a time when we didn't know the, the root cause. Do you have any information on the root cause, David? So in a different tweet, uh, Zero X Fubar, who is apparently really good at deducing stuff like this, says... It looks like the Slope wallet sent plain text seed phrases to external integration partners. I'm sorry, what? What? They it's not sh- mysterious at all. Just like another new. They mistake. just sent. They okay. So that's like if you know MetaMask. It gives you your your seed phrase and like it lets you it makes you copy it down. That's like if MetaMask was sending that same f- seed phrase to like Infura, and yeah. Infura was just like logging that. Uh, and so that's absolutely crazy. Um, compromised phantom wallets came from seed phrases importing imports used in slope. Compromised ETH wallets were also from seed phrase reuse. Uh, so I guess some, some Ethereum wallets were even compromised for, for people that generated their wallet using slope. This is not a blockchain or a random issue, randomness issue. This is a terribly irresponsible service provider issue. Fubar then later issues a correction saying the Slope Wallet did not send seed phrases to external partners, but may have logged them in their own centralized servers. Okay, well, then they're the external partner. Uh, apologies for getting a bit ahead of myself. It doesn't, Portmortem's still it, in progress. Whether they sent it to a third party or not, the fact that they were logging seed phrases in, in the database text, yeah. anywhere in plain text Mm-mm. where it could be hacked, that Mm-mm. is a massive problem. That is, so, that is terrible. Don't like save nothing- other people's seed phrases. Nothing mysterious here. It's just a, a really bad uh, wallet provider, yeah. um, basically. It's with, extremely you know, bad so, wallet provider. I mean, people were worried that, you know, th- there was like a blockchain the issue, blo- yeah, a randomness yeah, issue. Right. It's like mm-hmm. quantum computers. It's like hacked people's private keys, uh, mm-hmm. something like this. It was so mysterious. And it turns out it was just average, everyday, sharing private keys via plain text. And that's what screwed it over. So mystery solved, I guess, David. Do you have I any private so. key advice for us, though? 
Uh, like, I do. I do have one, but actually, before I do that, I would like to actually just shill the Coinbase app. Uh, I, I don't have. I'm not logged in because I don't have a Coinbase account. Um, but like, they have a, a multi-party computation wallet, so you can go and like use your Coinbase app as like a centralized, uh, you know, exchange, like, like as everyone does. But you can also go and like trade specifically on Uniswap or do stuff on MakerDAO or pool together because Coinbase has a multi-party computation wallet built into their app. So not only is it like a, a centralized custodian with a you know exchange built in like like we know, but it's also a self-sovereign wallet with multi-party computation, meaning that they have a shard of your private key. Your phone also has a shard of your private key, so they can restore your private key, but they don't have your private key. That's crazy. So like it's it's, Coinbase cool. doesn't doesn't get enough credit for that. Uh, and so Coinbase, Coinbase app. This is, and this is not even Coinbase wallet. This is the C Coinbase consumer app. So like. I, I, I want to go find out more about that wall because that is a really cool feature. Oh, we talked about it on a roll-up. Like, remember they, they came out with it at the Permissionless yeah. Conference? Yeah, I didn't, know, I didn't realize they had already rolled it out to the, the main core consumer app. Yeah, it's great. It's great. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's like, um, you know, there, there are some pieces of the design that are a bit more centralized than, say, a smart contract wallet, but it's yeah. like this nice place in the middle right. where it's a cool compromise. Right. And, and as totally. you said, they're getting it out to, uh, to users uh, right away. It's much better than a completely cust uh, custodied, centralized wallet mm -hmm. provider. But anyway, we, what do you we, do? We, What's your we, we, wait, before that, though, we had a guest on who was like, uh, they were explaining, maybe it was Mark Cuban. Yeah, it was Mark Cuban. He was, he was talking to his friends and like, I downloaded Coinbase and like, I couldn't find like the DeFi tab. There yeah. is now literally a DeFi, a tab, DeFi tab in tab. the Coinbase app nice. and you can do DeFi things and from the user perspective they get private keys but they don't even know it it's and, and they can't lose them it's great it's great anyways uh, so here, here's what I say um, I don't uh, this isn't the best advice but it definitely works it's a little bit of a brute force method I say every six months or so I generate a new set of private keys and I rotate my wallets and this removes all buildup of smart contract approval risk uh, and so I generate my own private keys uh, using using like the my ledger uh, and then every six months ago I just take my assets and I plop them into the new address. Uh, there are ways to achieve these same results. If you're worried about approval risk, you can just manually unapprove things. Um, uh, but also this approval also risk is another thing to worry about. It's not at play in either of these two right. hacks. It's just yet another thing you have to worry yes. about. <laughs> yes. If you approve a contract that sets permissions to all, like that contract can do whatever you want with all of your money. Um, and, but you can manually revoke those. So you like, you can get security that way, but this also removes like any sort of like accidental internet exposure to my private keys. There's been one times I, I have like a piece of paper. <laughs> I don't have it with me. I keep it elsewhere. Careful OPSEC, sir. Uh, but OPSEC. I have like a piece of paper with every previous seed phrase that I've ever used ever, whether, whether I've generated it with MetaMask, whether I've generated it with Ledger. Uh, it's got all my historical private keys on it and it's somewhere in the world. I'm not going to say where it's not with me. It's not where I live, <laughs> but but like and, and I, the reason why I keep that is for like airdrops, right? Like some sometimes some airdrop happens, and I'm like, fuck, I have to go like type in all of these like old seed phrases to go like, check out which one of these air addresses is relevant to the airdrop, and I type them into MetaMask, and so what was previously a Ledger seed phrase becomes like a MetaMask seed phrase, making it a hot wallet, uh, and so like I. I ba hell, hang on. I'm basically like putting all of my previous ledger seed phrases into my MetaMask, making it exposed to the internet. And so what I do is then I generate a new set of private keys and then, we, you know, in the appropriate way, not release to the internet. And then I make find a new address and I send all my assets to that brand new address. And so it's like always like a, ro a rotation of just like, you know, can't find me, can't catch me, can't catch me. I do not do any of those things, but I'm not sure if your method is like better than what I do. Um, <laughs> what do you do? Well, yeah, I'm not going to disclose that, David. Um, <laughs> Uh, but See, this is the, this is the beautiful thing about this is like I can tell like about my uh, private key yeah, management yeah. because it doesn't matter because it's always changing. Yeah, so uh, I I do think we should have an episode that is just all about like best practices for mm -hmm. opsec and private key management, like on the bankless journey. Just you know, it's not somebody that needs to disclose what they're doing, but it's like what are the best practices? Ten best practices, mm -hmm. different methods, practical, right. real world. Because like this stuff's hard. Is we call it the bankless journey for a reason, like, and bad things can happen to you, like bridge hacks, uh, like Oracle attacks, like economic right. attacks. You have to be careful what you use. And suddenly one day, if you use the wrong wallet, all your money gets stolen. Like this mm -hmm. is not easy stuff. Right. And the, the rewards are great on the other side, as we always say with, you know, kind of going bankless, but um, so are the risks. The risks are great as well. 
Anyway, mm -hmm. uh, that's your strategy. That's David's strategy. Yeah. It's, a, it's a nuclear of a strategy. And like, there's definitely other ways to achieve the same ends, but it's, it's what I do. It's interesting. Yeah, it's yeah. definitely cool. Um, yeah. All right. Are we going to get any tokens, David? <laughs> Last thing. Are we going to get any tokens from a new ETH proof of work chain, do you think? Uh, some free forked ETH before the merge? No. No, you will not. <laughs> yes. I mean, yes, you will have ether proof of work. No, it will be worth pennies. Uh, there's like the, a bunch of like people on Twitter talking about, oh, the, the proof of work chain, the proof of work chain. We're going to fork Ethereum and get all the like this extra tokens and extra ETH. Like, no, no, you're not. Some what, what's going to happen is that some people are going to are writing already writing transactions right now that are going to be sent in that very first or second block on the Ethereum proof of work chain that sells all of their tokens for Ether and Uniswap. It removes all of their Ether from Compound and Maker. It basically, there's going to be a massive run on the bank, except the bank is proof of work Ether. So every single token is going to go to zero. Uh, and there's actually a thread that, that we should read. Uh, so let, let's go to the thread by uh, Lemonscape. Uh, and uh, this is Mark Zeller from Ave and goes, a short thread about ETH proof of work and what is quite, like, quite likely to happen. Overnight with a fork, a carbon copy of the full Ethereum ecosystem appears. You have 10 ETH, well you also have 10 ETH proof of work. You have a position in Ave. now you have that same position on proof of work Ave. So let's begin with the big simple consequences. ETH proof of work means no proof of stake. So staked ETH ETH is now worth zero because it'll never be redeemable because it's on the staked ETH chain. On Aave proof of work, that means there's a $1.1 billion hole in the book because the Aave accounts for the value of staked ETH, but the proof of work staked ETH is goes to zero. On maker proof of work, that's $100 million of die backed by zero. That you can't is absolute mayhem, by the way. That's absolute mayhem. Yeah, all of a sudden, all the collateral and all the lending apps goes to zero. You can't have a, any fiat-backed stablecoin doubling the supply, obviously, overnight. So USDC and USDT proof-of-work supply goes to zero. So also collateral and MakerDAO and elsewhere. Circle and Tether can perhaps later support ETH proof-of-work, but the only way is to issue new ERC-20 tokens and forget the old ones. That's an additional $1.7 billion hole in Aave proof-of-work. That also means that 73% of MakerDAO collateral overnight is worth zero. Uh, so sorry to say, but this means that DAI proof of work and MKR proof of work are now also worth zero because MKR needs to get minted to cover debts in the MakerDAO system. But when your debt is billions of dollars and that, that brand new MKR token on the proof of work chain is already worth zero. So like, you know, you, you have to inflate your token that's already worth zero by infinity, making it worth zero even more. Uh, and so, like, just massive holes in collateral because, like, none, none of these tokens are worth anything on the proof of work chain. Basically, what's happening is, like, the token ecosystem, the DeFi app layer is going to be complete it's, it's, mayhem. The, the application layer of the proof of work chain is dividing by zero. It is imploding uh, on, on block number one. Uh, and so... Uh, <laughs> this also happens for like Uniswap, SushiSwap, all your favorite protocols. All tokens become worth zero because there's nothing there. Uh, and so if all the tokens are worth zero, it, what, what happens? And this is where like the whole run on the bank metaphor comes from. Uh, uh, the agenda for... Uh, Yes. Conclusion, DeFi proof of work is dead on arrival. Uh, and so here, here's what Lemonsgate says. The agenda for ETH proof of work shills. AMM liquidity will still be around because there will be like uni versus ETH pairs on the proof of work chain. But if you have any uni tokens, you're just going to like remove them all and buy as much ETH POW as possible. You have staked ETH tokens. And ETH, ETH POW is the new Ether. It's kind yes. of the leftover Ether. Yes. And not unofficially, it's just what people are calling it. Mm -hmm. So do you have any staked ETH tokens? Because those are worth zero. So you go to Curve, the proof of work Curve, and you dump those for ETH POW until AMMs are full of tokens and empty of proof of work Ether. So all tokens are being immediately sold for Ether, proof of work Ether, because it's the only token that has any like feasible semblance of having any value whatsoever. The plan is to collect as many ETH proof of work tokens as possible while shilling it on Twitter as like the one true ETH. Yes. That's what people do. That's what our, like uh, opportunists do. And then they wait for tier C centralized exchange listings like Poloniex, yep. deposit it there, and then try and dump it on like victims trying to buy, buy this shill. That's the plan. Everyone knows it. People have been talking about this for years. We've known this is going to be a thing for years. And so if you are a listener who's like, ooh, yay, I get like proof of work ether. I get some extra ether. Are you going to be the bot that writes these transactions? Because this is there's going to be a war on the first and second block of the proof of work Ethereum chain to do all of these things. And it's all going to be over in two blocks. Are you the listener capable of fighting that fight and getting your transaction in first ahead of the bots? Because if you are not, then you are not getting anything. That's the end of story. I still think, so 
Yes, that's one. Get out of here, outcome. Ryan. What do you no, still no, no. think? Dude, what do you I, still think? What I still think <laughs> that uh, what could happen is some narrative spinner rises up. You know, the Craig Wright mm-hmm. of uh, Pow Eth, the Roger Ver, some religious the figures. Pow Jesus yeah. rises up and says, "I will bring you a new narrative for this mm-hmm. for this uh, asset class. This is the true thing." And like we've we've just seen this happen so many times, David. Yeah, there've been. A lot of Bitcoin forks um, previously, most of them have completely failed. But a few of them have had some actual like multi-month, multi-year shelf lives. And those are the ones that are led by kind of some benevolent dictator, right. cult figure, right. re- you know, sort of religious figure. That's ultimately, I don't know about in Roger Ver's case, but Craig Wright's case, very clearly um, manipulating the community and trying to kind of like exit, exit scam, exit dump them. I know it's more complicated than a Bitcoin fork. Because Ethereum has this massive DeFi app layer. Right. But as you said, that's going to sort itself out. It's going to be completely drained. It's all going to go to ETH POW. There could be a figure that rises up and says, I'm going to take this narrative. I'm going to push it forward. I'm going to create a developer roadmap. I'm going to gather some funding. I'm going to get the help of uh, ETH POW miners. And the narrative could have a shelf life longer than a week, maybe multiple months. Again, I really don't care in either case. Like, if that happens, then maybe there's some ETH POW I can later sell, and that's a great thing. But I, all I would say is I think that is also a possibility. Sure. Possibility this thing fades out in like a day or a week. It's also a possibility because we've seen it before. Some cult leader rises and uh, brings a narrative to this chain and gives it some, some level of life because we've also seen that before. <laughs> You, is that going to be you, Ryan? You're going to be that cult leader? I, it's Proof not me, work, Ryan. <laughs> I, it's not me. I mean, like, I do not have that will and uh, no interest in doing that. But um, So there's a, there's a video that I like that I think resembles what's going to happen in blocks one and two of uh, the Proof of Work chain. And here's a video of uh, a San Diego fire, uh, 4th of July, where they accidentally had like a computer exploit, a computer bug. Uh, and instead of having a 45-minute fireworks show, every single firework just went off at once. <laughs> so we had like 45 minutes worth of fireworks all going down in like 30 seconds. And that's basically what's going to happen to this proof of work app layer. You think it's just going to be short, very short oh, yeah. show. And then yeah. it's yeah. over. Yeah. David, yeah, what's coming up next? All right. Coming up next, uh, sailor stepping down as CEO of MicroStrategy to do what, to do what perhaps to buy more Bitcoin, probably. And also Tiffany's selling crypto punk jewelry. I have a CryptoPunk. <laughs> Will I be getting a Tiffany's CryptoPunk necklace? Uh, really stay like tuned to, to find out, but I think you already know. <laughs> but if you don't, <laughs> stick around to find out. Uh, we'll be right back right after we talk about some of these fantastic sponsors that make the show possible. Arbitrum is an Ethereum layer two scaling solution that is going to completely change how we use DeFi and NFTs. Some of the coolest new NFT collections have chosen Arbitrum as their home, while DeFi protocols continue to see increased liquidity and usage. You can now bridge straight into Arbitrum for more than 10 different exchanges, including Binance, FTX, Huobi, and Crypto.com. Once on Arbitrum, you'll enjoy fast transactions with cheap fees, allowing you to explore new frontiers of the crypto universe. New to Arbitrum, for a limited time, you can get Arbitrum NFTs designed by the famous artists Ratwell and Sugoi. For joining the Arbitrum Odyssey. The Odyssey is an eight week long event where you complete on chain activities and receive a free NFT as a reward. Find out more by visiting the Discord at discord.gg slash Arbitrum. You can also bridge your assets to Arbitrum at bridge.arbitrum.io and access all of Arbitrum's apps at portal.arbitrum.one in order to experience DeFi and NFTs the way it was always meant to be fast, cheap, secure, and friction free. The Layer 2 era is upon us. Ethereum's Layer 2 ecosystem is growing every day, and we need Layer 2 bridges to be fast and efficient in order to live a Layer 2 life. Across is the fastest, cheapest, and most secure cross-chain bridge. With Across, you don't have to worry about high fees or long wait times. Assets are bridged and available for use almost instantaneously. Across's bridges are powered by UMA's optimistic oracle to securely transfer tokens between Layer 2s and Ethereum. Across is critical ecosystem infrastructure, and Across V2 has just launched. Their new version focuses on higher capital efficiency, layer two to layer two transfers, and a brand new chain with Polygon, all while prioritizing high security and low fees. You can be a part of Across's story by joining their Discord and using Across for all of your layer two transferring needs. So go to across.to to quickly and securely bridge your assets between Ethereum, Optimism, Polygon, Arbitrum, or Boba networks.
All right, guys, we're back. And speaking of bridge compromises again, um, Aave seems to be stepping back from its multi-chain strategy. And why? Because of some of these bridge compromises that have been happening. So um, Aave st stepping back from Phantom, I believe, which is sort of an EVM fork uh, chain. Uh, Mark Zeller, who we were just talking about, um, said Lemonscape, this. They, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Lemonscape. Is, the rationale is after the Harmony Bridge event, the recent Nomad Bridge exploit, the Aave community should consider the risk benefits keeping an active Aave V3 market on Phantom as this network is dependent on any swap multi-chain bridge. Um, Zeller actually, uh, in the tweet thread as well, he, he said he was wrong. He said, hey, I was wrong to be so aggressive on kind of the multi-chain strategy. Uh, and uh, yeah, that was just really, really interesting, interesting. Um, to interesting. hear from him. And it's like, you know, not wrong in a big way, but maybe right. a bit more aggressive during the bull market. Right. Right. And now seeing that, um, hey, some of these risks are real. And by the way, kudos to anyone who ever admits they're wrong in crypto. Certainly. Because that yeah. is a rare event in and of itself. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, basically, this is a, a classic cost benefit calculation uh, is how how much uh, fees is Aave generating on Phantom and how much is that risk of that multi chain bridge and Aave governance. This hasn't this isn't a formal thing. This is a governance proposal. Uh, but the proposal is saying, hey, the cost to cost to, uh, rewards is just not there. So let's just trim Phantom. Um, I mean, it makes sense in a bear market where like, you know, some chains don't really make it. Um, so Phantom not doing so hot. All right. Moving on. Sushi Swap new head chef is asking for one third of all the tokens that are paid to the staff, which is a very contentious proposal. But there's a, a DAO debate with SushiSwap about how well compensated the SushiSwap head chef should be. Um, I kind of think that SushiSwap needs some sort of like highly competent, highly centralized leader to like kind of steward this ship, especially as we're seeing things kind of like drift off in the bear market. Uh, but SushiSwap going through some governance debates right now. That's like executive compensation debate in DAOs yeah. right now. That's kind right, of interesting. Right. Here's a great thread out of Optimism about Optimism Bedrock, which is Optimism Bedrock coming soon, TM. And when it does, it will change the roll-up game forever. It will lay the protocol's foundation for years to come and serve as the model for roll-up architecture. Its name is Bedrock for good reason. There are a few awesome things that this Bedrock architecture does for Optimism. It reduces the L1 to L2 deposit time by 4x, and it also slashes the cost of data submission by 20%, making uh, fees 20% cheaper. But those are all really cool things that all the users can understand. But really, the really bullish thing is this third thing. Cuts the difference with Geth down to a slim 500 lines of code. Uh, and so uh, Kevin Fil uh, Fi uh, Filchner, who is at, um, on the Optimism team, he puts this tweet together and goes, Optimism's Bedrock design is the most advanced roll-up architecture ever built. It's not a competition. Bedrock is close to theoretically optimal on every front. Optimal transaction fees, optimal diff, difference, uh, optimal networking, optimal block production. And what, what they are mean by optimal is related to this 500 fee difference between Optimism Bedrock and Geth. They're trying to get as, cl as close to Ethereum equivalents as possible. And so when we talk about bridge risk and all of these smart contract risks, when you reduce the lines of code down to something like Geth, which has been tried and true in Ethereum for eight years and running now, then you have a stronger and stronger assurances that there's less and less attack surface area. Uh, and so when I see these words like theoretically optimal on every front, I get like really hot and bothered, Ryan, because I love things that are theoretically optimal. Uh, and so the, the fewer lines between Geth and a, and a layer two, the more secure you can feel about using these layer twos. Uh, and the other thing I'll say about this is when you have something that is closer and closer and closer to Geth, the software that we've already been using in Ethereum for years, you can like bedrock can become like a foundation for a thousand rollups to bloom because it's not that complicated. It's so simple. It's so close to this infrastructure that we've already had. So the forkability of get of bedrock to allow a thousand secure layer twos to bloom is like off the charts. So I'm just super bullish about that. Yeah, I am glad that uh, optimistic rollups are innovating, and of course, uh, uh, Arbitrum's Nitro is coming up too. So it's like Bedrock versus Nitro, mm -hmm. and they're mm -hmm. both kind of competing for attention. And Nitro here. also also something that is trying to emulate Geth as well. These are the same same design structures. Yeah, uh, very 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 similar design structures and patterns, and I'm just happy to see them wearing it out for users. Um, David, did you know the Ethereum chain is seven years old? Happy, Happy birthday. birthday. I said eight. Happy birthday to Ethereum. Yay. Who are we Yay. Here? Here's a picture of Vitalik and his dad. <laughs> <laughs> Unrelated, actually, <laughs> from Ethereum's birthday. <laughs> yeah. We're definitely related, father, son. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Great to see them on something, Ethereum's something. birthday. 
Um, Moving Bitcoin into stuff. Some Bitcoin stuff. Yeah. Michael Saylor leaves the CEO role, role to assume executive chairman role. So uh, Michael Saylor, no longer the CEO of MicroStrategy, has stepped down while a, a different individual um, uh, stepped into the CEO of MicroStrategy, Wait, which makes he- sense. I mean, he's become so interested in Bitcoin. He's much less interested in, like, you know, MicroStrategy is a business analytics company, like, right. you know, kind yeah. of software for, like, business dashboards Things and stuff like that. Things that are unrelated this. to Bitcoin, yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. so he's ve- he's very uh, interested in Bitcoin. He has, like, uh, 70% uh, voting majority over MicroStrategy. Yeah. So basically, he governs MicroStrategy. Now he's decided to step down to pursue yeah. Bitcoin initiatives. Um, so <laughs> to buy more Bitcoin, <laughs> I guess, I guess that's what he's doing. There's a take from Nassim Taleb here. What is he saying? Yeah. Nassim Taleb, who's all famously anti-Bitcoin says, how much of the 120,000 Bitcoin will they have to sell? Another nail in the coffin to the will never sell. I actually don't think there's any precedent. Like, no, like actually they're leaning into bit- buying Bitcoin, not trying to sell, but it's just funny. Micro strategy is micro strategy. Yeah. You don't think, um, um like Sailor was kind of like asked to to leave or something and go focus on Bitcoin if that's what he's so interested in. And I think now- that is what happened. They're like Sailor, like th- this micro strategy company still needs to do its micro strategy things. You become like the chairman of buying Bitcoin. The, Bitcoin like CEO. You have, yeah, Bitcoin CEO. Yeah, but no, Nick, Nick, Nicholas just wants a grave dance, even though there's no grave to dance on. We'll see. Anyways. I don't know. They they might sell more Bitcoin as a result of this, but um, hopefully not in the bear market. I still I still contend. I think MicroStrategy's I Bitcoin talk. buys are going to pay off for them. Yeah. And like these kind of tweets will not hold up well because Bitcoin yes. is going to go up in price. That's still like the bottom line to me. And just people yes. are impatient. And they always like to point when things are down and say, oh, it'll never work out. And then they never come back and correct themselves. Right. Uh, but Tiffany's, what are they oh, doing God. in the NFT space? Uh, they are doing NF tiffs. NF Tiffany's, oh, I guess, God, no. uh, releasing on August 5th. Is that tomorrow? Yeah, that is tomorrow. Uh, uh, 250, I believe, Tiffany's CryptoPunk NFT necklaces, jeweled necklaces, are being released at the low, low price of 30 ETH. 250 what? limited edition CryptoPunk ne- necklaces being sold for $51,000 at the price of 30 ETH. What's a CryptoPunk uh, necklace? Uh, it'll, yeah, so here, here's the video. It'll play out. Wait, how much is this? What are we looking at? Fifty-one thousand dollars. So, like a this bunch of this is just like, an NFT. So you can't have no, 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 your no. Crypto it's a real necklace. It. It's a real necklace. It's a real necklace. It's a real. Oh, necklace. this is a real necklace. A real, okay. real diamonds, real rubies. It's, yeah, it's What's a real the necklace. NFT part. It's it's that, your it's so so you you can't mint any uh, crypto punk. You can have a uh, Tiffany's necklace of your crypto punk for for thirty ETH. Is this something that is wanted? Like, what's the market for this, David? Well, there's only 250 of them, and it's, and it's one of these things where, like, if you are somebody who's going to buy one of these things, you're going to confuse all the other people who are like, why the hell are you buying it? Like, <laughs> it only takes 250 people to be like, yeah, fine, I'll buy one of those. $50,000. Uh, I love so this Here's a take from, from Aubrey. Uh, Aubrey Strobel. Imagine your boyfriend gives you a Tiffany box, and you open it up, and it's a crypto pump. <laughs> I'm sure that they would just love that. That would be so great for them. <laughs> I'm sure they wow. would just be overjoyed. There's someone out there, though, that's going to buy one and be happy to receive one. Uh, maybe you just have to find that special someone, David. Yeah, right. Yeah. All right. Keep on looking. Magic Eden. Oh, my God. They changed their Twitter handle to Magic Ethan. Yeah. Well, first of all, what is Magic Eden? And yeah, what are they it's doing? a Solana NFT platform. It's like the uh, OpenSea of Solana. Uh, what are they doing? They are now becoming the Magic Eden of Ethereum. Uh, so they are integrating Ethereum into their NFT platform. Uh, it seems like wise expansion strategy. Yep. Um, what do we got here, David? Shaq? Yeah. Yeah. So th- this is like, uh, of course, I am sure triggered some of like the Solana maxis out there. It's like, oh, you guys are abandoning Solana. They're going to Ethereum, even though they are just trying to make the best NFT platform that exists. Uh, and Shaq replies to the tweet. Shaquille O'Neal replies to the tweet and says, I wonder, and people wonder why I took dot soul out of my name. I didn't even know Shaq had dot soul in his name. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan commenting saying, but you didn't add dot ETH. Um, <laughs> 1,700 likes on that. Um, is Shaq wearing a, what it looks like some sort of like ape as his well, profile picture? Well, what do you think ape. he's saying? This is not clear to me. Why did he take dot soul out of his name? Is it because... Uh, you can scroll down and there will be a little bit more of a conversation. Uh, he, he says, there's no point in picking a side anymore. Everyone uh, needs to stop tearing each other down. Okay. Yeah. Well, I take that <laughs> And then back. Evan Van Ness says, no one needs to tear Solana down. It's always down. <laughs> oh, jeez. 
<laughs> man, burn oh, culture man. in uh, crypto Twitter is great. Uh, yeah, what's Rainbow great. doing? The wallet, Ra- NFT wallet. Yeah, speaking of more NFT stuff, now supporting NFTs on mainnet, Polygon, Arbitrum, and Optimism. Uh, for some reason, saying thank you, Treasure Dow, for the gift. I wonder. Oh, they got they got a little um, some small. Uh, the, the Treasure Dow is an ecosystem, NFT ecosystem on Arbitrum. Anyways, NFTs on uh, Rainbow Wallet. That's cool. Uh, optimistic NFTs, Arbitrum NFTs on Rainbow mm-hmm. Wallet. Uh, and what do we got here? Aspect, uh, Starknet, yeah. Mainnet. Is this NFTs for Starknet? Yeah, NFTs on Starknet, the uh, the uh, generalized uh, ZK rollup platform out of Starkware. Uh, so cool. That that means super cheap NFTs, super cheap, super fast. Uh, regulation. Let's talk about this really quick. So yeah. Robinhood was just fined thirty million dollars from the New York State Department of Financial Services (NYDFS). Mm. And why were they charged for this? It looks like some sort of uh, money laundering um, issue. Mm-hmm. Uh, what did they do? Yeah, they said uh, the NF- NYDFS charged Robinhood because they were in- inadequately staffed, didn't have sufficient resources to address risks, risks, and failed uh, timely transaction from a manual transaction monitoring system to one that was adequate for its user size and transaction volume. Basically, not adequately monitoring like AML and money laundering um, shenanigans. I have Oof. no takes on this. Kind of, I have no I, takes on that. You know, New York State Department's always a bit. Um, you know, crypto unfriendly, I would say. Yes, so I wouldn't be surprised yes. if they're blowing a big, a small thing out of proportion, but also yeah. I do not know. Uh, but this is cool, David. A Senate yeah, bill big. that it would hand Bitcoin and Ether oversight to the commodities regulator, the CFTC, basically mm-hmm. institute by law and say that Ether and Bitcoin are commodities. It's kind of a reigning Gary Gensler in the SEC back. Yeah. I know yeah. there's been, like the SEC has never given us a super straight take on whether Ether is a commodity or a security or how they view it. They've been right. a bit more um, clear on Bitcoin as, as being a commodity, but we sort of need mm-hmm. this legislation. It's a bit of reining in from the SEC to at least say these two assets we know clearly are commodities. Right. And this f- follows from, I think, Hester Peirce and a few others takes of, of saying like good crypto regulation is ultimately going to come from Congress, not these three letter agencies that we do not elect. Uh, yes. And so if Congress could go ahead and please approve this one, that would be great. Gary Gensler, neener, neener, boo, boo. Get your hands off our commodities. <laughs> <laughs> and yet uh, I got to give credit where it's due. The SEC sure. this this week charged, uh, charged a um, group called F- uh, Forsage. Forsage? For- Forsage? 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 I don't know. Forsage. Um, this was a $300 billion crypto Ponzi scheme. And mm. I vaguely remember this. It was just blatantly a Ponzi, kind of BitConnect level stuff. And this is the sort of thing that we want the SEC to do. It's like, Mm -hmm. there's so many bad guys and clear scams in the crypto space. Please help us go catch them, right? Right. Like go after them, give us clarity, give the the good actors in the space, a sandbox, a playground, and go chase after the clear scammers because there's enough of that work to go do. And this is an example of them doing that, doing the right thing, going after a clear Ponzi scheme. Well done. Thank you, Gary. Well uh, you did something great. David, Sad. can you believe this yep. is still happening? Yeah. So like Celsius. add insult to injury. What's happening mm-hmm. here? Celsius admits customer emails linked in third party data breach. So not only did you lose your money, but you also lost your privacy with Celsius. <laughs> Two for one punch. <laughs> Oof. Thanks, guys. Uh, Babel Finance, $280 million loss. Babel Finance is a CFI crypto lender. We've seen them before. Uh, lost $250 uh, dollar, uh for $280 million in customer funds doing trading. They were trying to trade their way into profit, but they traded their way into losses. With um, their customers' oof. funds. With, with their customers' funds. Another CeFi company, uh, more popular in Great. Asia. David, uh, some good news on the releases front. Coinbase Prime is now offering Ethereum staking to institutions in the U.S., Mm. more staking uh, heating up. Um, What is the Swell Network here, David? Yeah, Swell Network is also part of the Ethereum staking world. Uh, Lido, Rocket Pool, StakeWise, a few others, but also Swell Network soon. This is a kind of a hotly anticipated uh, staking as a service uh, uh, like DAO, uh, kind of like like Lido, but also a little bit like Rocket Pool. Uh, Mainnet release uh, candidate uh, is now live, uh, which means that they are only one step away from Mainnet go live. Uh, So I'm very excited for Swell. Also, we, we know that GameStop has been working with Immutable, but now that relationship is formally intertwined with the GameStop wallet. Uh, and so the GameStop NFT ecosystem and the Immutable Layer 2 system are now integrated. Uh, and so you can only imagine that like the uh, Immutable X Layer 2 is going to be facilitating the marketplace for GameStop. I'm getting a little bit closer to that here. 
Uh, I think the wallet has been based on loop ring. So it looks like they're using multiple yeah. layer yes. twos as their yes. strategy, not just loop ring, but also Both ZK rollups though. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Uh, J- David on the, on the raises front, uh, variant fund. This is a fund um, from Jesse. Um, who else is on the Jesse fund? Walden, Lee Jen. Yeah. Yes. Lee Jen, of course, $450 million to support the leading founders in web three. This is kind of the, uh, the, the, the creator economy type of investment and they just raised $450 million. So, uh, impressive Congrats, raise. Yeah. Um, Gary V from V friends just closed a round with a 16 Z crypto. So this is a $50 million round. That's a I lot. Believe. That's a lot of money. That's a lot for Gary V's NFT project. Um, yeah, yeah kind of impressive valuations happening during the mm-hmm. bear market still too. Yeah, so I guess there's money, there's raises. It's what does money. that mean for jobs, David? That there are jobs. If there's money and there's raises, then there are jobs. What are we That's how it works. Here? Let me read a few out. Um, the yeah. first from Boardroom Labs. They're looking for a software engineer over DAO governance. Manticore Games, a manager of crypto marketing. That's not technical. Bankless. We're looking for thread ors. You can write a good Twitter, Twitter, Twitter. thread. Uh, on Vertex on Twitter protocol. All day. Yeah, like as as we are, but apparently we don't have time to write enough threads. <laughs> Vertex uh, protocol, a marketing coordinator. That's not um, technical. Bankless, we're looking for a UX UI designer. Bankless yep. also, we need a senior newsletter uh, engineer. Best job in crypto. Streams, a financial analyst. Stakefish, smart contract software engineer. Also a backend software engineer. Also a blockchain marketer. Non technical. Also a DevOps engineer. And the Bankless Academy is hiring a product manager. There's a ton more jobs here. You can go find them at the Bankless. Wait, wait, wait. Boards. There's a head of marketing at Pleaser Dow. I just want to shout that one out. Uh, oh. Also got to be a very, very cool job. One hundred to two hundred thousand dollars salary. Head of marketing at Pleaser Dow. Come join the Dow. Uh, a Willy Wonka. Fa- <laughs> Pleaser Dow is the People's Louvre and the Twenty First yeah. Century and a Willy Wonka, Willy Wonka factory combined. That's <laughs> <laughs> very attractive. Only in crypto. Only in crypto. <laughs> All right. When we get back. Some questions from the Bankless Nation. What's the safest token to dollar cost average into over the next 12 months? Also, the best advice for actually getting a job in crypto and some hot takes from crypto Twitter as usual. We'll get right to those things. But first, we want to tell you about the sponsors that made this episode possible. There is a brand new staking feature in the Ledger Live app today. We all like staking the assets that we're bullish on. And now you can stake seven different coins inside the Ledger Live app. Cosmos, Polkadot, Tron, Algorand, Tezos, Solana, and of course, Ethereum. With Ledger Live, you can take money from your bank account, buy your most bullish crypto asset, and stake that asset to its network, all inside the Ledger Live app. Through a partnership with Figment, Ledger also lets you choose which validator you want to stake your assets with. And Ledger is running its own validating nodes, offering a convenient way to participate in network validation, and it even comes with slashing insurance. Ledger Live is truly becoming the battle station for the bankless world, so go download Ledger Ledger Live. If you have a ledger already, you probably already have it and get started securely staking your crypto assets. The Brave browser is the user-first browser for the Web3 internet with over 60 million monthly active users. And inside the Brave browser, you'll find the Brave wallet, the secure multi-chain crypto wallet built right into the browser. Web3 is freedom from big tech and Wall Street, more control and better privacy, but there's a weak point in Web3, your crypto wallet. And most crypto wallets are browser extensions, which can easily be spoofed. But the Brave wallet is different. No extensions are required, which gives Brave browser an extra level of security versus other wallets. Brave wallet is your secure passport for the possibilities of Web3 and supports multiple chains, including Ethereum and Solana. You can even buy crypto directly inside the wallet with RAMP. And of course, you can store, send, and swap your crypto assets, manage your NFTs, and connect to other wallets and DeFi apps. So whether you're new to crypto or you're a seasoned pro, it's time to ditch those risky extensions, and it's time to switch to the Brave wallet. Download Brave at brave.com slash bankless and click the wallet icon to get started. All right, guys, we are back. And just a reminder, if you have a question for Dave and myself to read out on the roll-up, make sure you follow Bankless HQ on Twitter. Every Wednesday, a tweet goes out and ask for those questions. Here's the first question from madge80.eth. If you had to monthly dollar cost average into one asset for the next 12 months, what would it be? Except ETH. I'm thinking RPL, that's the Rock Pool token, and Uni. Of course, got to say, none of this is financial advice. Of course He's not. asking David's personal opinion from an entertainment perspective. Entertainment myself. That's entertaining but- answer. I want, yes, I want the real answer, but also it's fine if it's entertaining, David. I actually genuinely want to know what would you buy besides ETH right now? You know, I I think Madge is onto something with with Uni. Uh, I think that is, if we're not talking about Ether and we're not counting staked Ether, which I'm assuming we're not, uh, then the Uni token definitely comes next. And the reason why it's, I feel like, very arguably the safest is because it's generating the most fees. 
And so that, I feel like, is a great definition of safety. Like right now, uh, Uniswap generated $1. million today in 24-hour fees. Uh, and there's already discussions on the Uniswap governance uh, uh, forum about turning on the fee switch. So like we're getting there. And so if we're going to define like, what is the best asset for the next 12 months to buy, it's the one with fees. The ones that come after that, like Aave, uh, GMX, also surprisingly up there. Um, uh, and so like, you know, tokens with fees are bullish. Uh, and so there's probably some analysis to be done about like how much fees is the protocol generating compared to how big that market cap is with a, with a controlling function of how much revenue, how much uh, percentage can that protocol capture as a result of those fees. Some analysis to be done there. Um, Rocket Pool, a great token because of the, the merge trade. Uh, but the, is the merge trade going to last for 12 months? I'm not sure. But Uniswap fees will definitely last for 12 months. Yeah, I, I, I kind of agree. So it's like, I'm going to ignore Bitcoin because I actually think I would still prioritize Mm -hmm. DeFi tokens right now yeah. over Bitcoin. And maybe yeah. that's for the first time ever. I would have, generally my answer is ETH and Bitcoin. Those are the yeah, assets right. to dollar cost average into. But if like you're going to ask my personal opinion, it would probably be some of those blue chip DeFi assets. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. I like Uni and Aave, know they're going to be around very strong. Although I also like a lot of the strong layer two projects that yeah. have tokens right now. Yeah. I feel like that's a decent bet. Uh, and I would pick those over the alternative layer one bet, even though like oh, God, yeah. Solana is going to survive. Uh, obviously, Cosmos, the, they are all going to survive. But I still feel like layer two is being underappreciated. So you got Matic token, you got OP, right. some of those things as well. I would consider dollar cost averaging into some of those as well. But, yeah. you know, this isn't necessarily the question that's like, what's the... Um, the token, the asset that you're going to make the most money on over the next right. 12 months. This is more the one that you're going to Risk kind of reward. buy and hold. Yeah, risk from a risk reward perspective. Um, yeah. Good question. I do think that they even, it's so like RPL and like Lido and Stakewise are all benefiting from uh, like the merge trade. Yep. I think general DeFi tokens that like Uniswap and Synthetics are also going to benefit from just like the beta of the merge. So, like Ether goes up, staking as a service tokens goes up, but then Ethereum apps are also going to go up. Just it's, it's going to be like an Ethereum rotation. So I think the, the beta is in heavily favored of, of the Ethereum ecosystem at the moment. Yeah, I would say that too. And I, I do like some of those staking tokens as well. I'd start to yeah. classify them as close to blue chip. Um, yeah. All right, here's another question, David, from Patrick Dudley. What advice would you give a college student looking to get a job in crypto after they graduate? I'm going to my senior year at SDSU and really want to pr pursue a career in crypto. Yeah, the, definitely the unequivocally best advice for getting a job in crypto. If you want to get a job, the formula is as simple as this. Write really good threads on Twitter. <laughs> like People are doing this. If you want to get a job at a fund, funds will like notice you on Twitter. If you want to get a job at Bankless, we are literally hiring a tweet thread or. People that can write threads and get like a thousand likes and just generate a following and capture, capture attention on Twitter, if you can do that, you will be handed a job on a, on a silver platter. Okay, so for people who aren't on Twitter though, like what, what does it take to actually write a thread, David? What, what does a thread mm. do on Twitter? Right, so it distills information down and like the, the reason why Twitter is, is what it is in this crypto space is that it forces big ideas to be like condensed and collapsed and concentrated down to, into a very short, a single tweet, 280 characters. And so what you are doing when you are writing a tweet thread is you are learning how to communicate and explain things with extreme, extremely small packages. Uh, and so that's just good, efficient communication. So it's basically like a litmus test for can you communicate very, very well. If you can thread well, you can communicate well. If you can communicate well, that's like the meta skill. Uh, and so people are judging other people's like abilities to like do good work by their ability to write threads. Yeah, I'm going to plus one that. It also forces you to go digest some complicated information and yeah. break it down uh, mm -hmm. atomically. So you have to really understand it if you're going to publish a mm -hmm. thread. And then of course, because Twitter is a social network, it's basically your online resume. Right. You, you can it, tweet it people LinkedIn. and be like, yeah. Get can, off of LinkedIn. Like, Get on yeah, to Twitter. Totally. Uh, that's where that's where crypto is. That's where you get noticed. I've seen so many people launch their career by doing that is, yeah. um, you know, becoming threaders. Hello. And then you, you, you start to write in other areas or you get hired by a VC mm -hmm. company or, you know, whatever your, whatever your main skill set is, mm -hmm. um, that's a way to launch. Both oh. me and Ryan, like, launched our public personas on Twitter and then we found each other on Twitter and then we started Bankless on Twitter. 
and now we're hiring tweet threaders <laughs> for Twitter. It's yeah, Twitter. it's like yeah. there's just such serendipity to it. Um, you got to yeah. be part of it. You can't yeah. you can't ignore uh, Twitter right now. Um, all right, David, let's get Hot to picks. some takes. First Hot from picks. Balaji. This is uh, I'm going to read it out from Balaji Srinivasan. Actually, podcast episode coming with him on Monday. That is a do not miss episode. We talk yeah. about concepts like this, but here's what he's tweeting: the realigning from red versus blue to orange versus green. Mm. Decentralized network versus centralized state, internationalists and capitalists versus nationalists and socialists, the cloud versus the land, and Bitcoin versus the dollar. And he's showing that political compass square. Uh, maybe mm -hmm. you can describe this image for us, what we're seeing here, David. Yeah, the political compass is on the left, you have the left. On the right, you have the right. So liberals on the left, conservatives on the right, yeah, yeah, politically. But top to down, you have authoritarianism versus libertarianism. Uh, and so like we've, we've said on Bankless, Bankless isn't a left or right movement, but it is an individual versus like uh, versus authoritarian movement. So we lean down towards like the libertarian side of things. Uh, although we do appreciate structure, uh, it's de definitely like prioritizing the individual over like the state. Uh, and so what Balaji is saying is that what is previously like a red versus blue, left versus right phenomenon is slowly turning into a a 99% uh, versus 1%, which he's resembling as Bitcoin versus the dollar. The dollar being the state, Bitcoin being the people. Uh, and so I, I think that makes sense, especially as we've been putting this into a context of, uh, of um, uh, the, end, the end of a cycle of nation state power, where like the nation state is no longer concerned about like, do we want to be conservative or do we want to be progressive? We are now just like, all right, who's capturing all the value? Is it the individual or is it the, the incumbents? Uh, and so uh, this is, this is the, the, instead of left versus right, Balaji is saying it's top versus down. Yeah, and this goes into his idea. A book he recently come up with that we, uh, we talk about at length is a book called The Network State. And he's really mm -hmm. pinning this as it's kind of the authoritarian nation state versus the people's network state. Uh, anyway, really fascinating conversation with him. Uh, stay tuned for that on Monday. Uh, David, a tweet from Sassel. Anthony Sassano, mm -hmm. what's he saying? Yeah, first he says, first layer twos won't work and are useless technology. And now it's, if layer twos get big enough, it will become its own layer one and abandon Ethereum. If this is the first time you've heard this take, it means you need to get on Twitter. Uh, <laughs> when, and, and Sazel finishes saying, when you see the goalposts move like this, it means the critics never actually knew what they were talking about in the first place. Hot do you know what, also, do you know what this also means, I think? Because I think the rotators are rotating into layer twos or they're getting mm. ready to. And that's mm. why they're seeding this as mm. the next kind of narrative. I think the mm. alt one trade is is somewhat dormant right now, somewhat yeah, over yeah, for the time way. being. Big and way. now the L2 narrative trade is on. So what do yeah. you have to do? You have to um, prop up layer twos and their value accrual mechanisms from a narrative perspective and, and put down ETH uh, in order to get that trade going. So I think they'll probably be effective and I'm starting to see some of the rotators rotate in. Of course, rotators gonna rotate. Always gonna miss Suzu and three hours capital, the ultimate <laughs> rotators. Um, not going to happen this cycle though. This is a Vitalik tweet. What's he saying? Yeah. Vitalik says, call out scammers. You get hate in the moment, but time vindicates you. Even if you're some CEO with quote reputation and need for quote professionalism, do it anyways and be savage. People what? look up to you and your warning will be taken seriously. Is this Vitalik uh, so, speaking? Be savage. Yeah, this is Vitalik. Yeah. Be savage. Yeah. It's a new Vitalik. Uh, so Vitalik called out the force age people, the people that just got charged with the SEC forever ago. Uh, and so, uh, and then he got attacked probably this, I think this is a ch Chinese community, Chinese project, maybe, I don't know. Um, uh, which is why I didn't, didn't really hear about it, but, uh, he said he, he, he's alluding to how he got attacked by the force age community probably. Uh, but now, now they're being charged with running a Ponzi scheme. So who's laughing in the end? It's Vitalik. He said this about force age back in 2020, yes. please yes. leave and don't pollute the Ethereum ecosystem in the future. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Very metallic thing to say. What, what, do you, what do you think about this? Is it incumbent on um, the community to call out scammers more yeah. often? Well, yeah. one thing I struggle with about this, David, is um, sometimes the term scammer gets overused, right? Right. I think in this case, it was like very clearly a scammer. So maybe, so maybe when something is very clearly kind of black, Right, in the black category, and there's no, there's no gray about it, that's the right. time to pile on. But it was not clear to me, for example, if we, if we start putting like Luna and Terra into that category, whether Luna and Terra was a complete scam at the time. I thought it was like a flawed mechanic and like a, like a very risky, broken thing to invest into, and I didn't think it would work long term. Right. But I can't necessarily call that a scam. I don't think right. that Vitalik is talking about that category of things, is he? Mm, I think so. 
like it's definitely one of the things that I learned out of 2020 is that like my intuitions are better than I thought they were. And so like, you know, I got into that fight with Danny Sesta from Wonderland uh, and then uh, like his army like descended on me and like made me put my tail between my legs because of like Twitter drama. And then and then he blew up. And if I had been like had a like a little bit more like confidence and conviction, it's like, yo, this is not right. I might be would have said something. Same thing with Do Kwan, just repeated it. It's like got attacked by Do Kwan. It's like, damn, this, their army is really loud. I don't really want to don't really want to like pick my head up. And then boom, they blow up. And if I had a little bit more of just like, I don't really give a fuck about you. I'm going to be proven right in the long term. Then I think I would have gotten more credit than, than we did, even though we did like call out uh, call out Tara. I think decently, I think we could have done it better. I, so maybe David's going to lean into that a little bit more. I'm still probably going to veer a bit more conservative. Like I think right. da- I think uh, Vitalik's right. right for calling out something like this, but sometimes mm-hmm. I am wrong, right? Like sometimes right. it's not like the mechanic does actually work in the in the long run. Anyway, I think there's time for me, at least me personally, like a period of of skepticism before I start using the S word. But sure. then there are things that are very clearly scam. Like for example, Celsius. Some people are saying Celsius was a scam. I just didn't have enough information oh, yeah, to know whether scam. it was or not, right? Yeah. But like, yeah. it turns out it was. I don't know, stuff like well, that. There's a lot in the gray area. Celsius is a scam? I thought was, Celsius just was egregiously mismanaged. I think it. I think that verges on scam of like Alex Mashensky calling himself a uh, DeFi oh. bank and then yeah, calling taking himself, the funds. Yeah, right, yes. Calling and himself like DeFi and not it, a basically. banker. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. All right. What take from me? I say this. <laughs> it's true. People don't care about decentralization. There's a lot of talk about that this week. A lot of talk about people not caring about decentralization. And I said, it's true. People don't care about decentralization. People don't care about decentralization until they get Mt. Gox or Suzu'd or Do Kwan or Mashinsky'd. They don't care because they're new and haven't been screwed yet. Eventually, people care about decentralization. When I got into crypto in the very beginning, I didn't care very much about decentralization. You know what I cared about, David? Uh, Number go up. Number go up. Like, it was like, I cared about other things, this idea of Bitcoin, you know, um, sovereign money, but I didn't understand the intricacies of like why decentralization matters until I started see, to see things in, in the crypto space. I, you know, read about the Mt. Gox, um, see kind of the centralization vectors. Uh, and I do think people start to care about it over time, but they don't start with that position as their default. They have to kind of learn it uh, sometimes by being in crypto for a period of time. Of course, as, as one does. What's my take? What's yours? Uh, I think this was my take last week, but uh, here's my take. The best thing that could ever happen to crypto, a fees-driven bull market, a.k.a. a sustainable and rational bull market. Is that like too much to ask? Is a rational bull market? Why is that more rational? Because if it's fees driven, it means it's revenue driven. I mean, if it's revenue driven, this is how we've been like, uh, like measuring assets since like the beginning of time. Is fundamentals. It's, it's asking assets. for a fundamentals-driven bull market. Can it's we like have one of those, people, please? Real people are paying for the service, yes. and it's actually yes. providing real profit not based to on the speculation. owners yes. of the asset. Yeah. yeah, that would be pretty healthy. That would feel pretty yeah. good. I would like that. It, you can, think we're going to get can it? Can I have this, please? <laughs> <laughs> is, it, is, is it that crazy? David only wants one thing for Christmas. <laughs> Fee-driven uh, bull market. Yeah. You know, some people think it's cringe, Ryan, that we read out our own tweets as takes of the week. No, really? <laughs> Yeah, well, well maybe, some people think it's great. Whatever I, we do is cringe. I should I should read out your tweets and you read out my tweets. Is yeah, that yeah, less that's cringe? What, that's what we usually do, yeah. I mean, they're right. called takes of the week, so yeah. right, we have takes sometimes. Yeah, yeah. I feel like uh, we have good takes. Sorry for the cringe, guys. Uh, <laughs> Udi, I'm sorry for the cringe. Uh, oh, my David. God. P- people don't know, know that metaphor. What, what, what are you think? excited about this week? Uh, I'm excited for your tokens, Ryan. There's a bunch of tokens. that This is my uh, coin gecko watch list. Uh, and so uh, th- these are the tokens I'm currently looking at. And there's a bunch of them that are up bigly. Stakewise up 107% in seven days. Optimism up 90%. Euler up 69%. Nice. Yearn up 51%. Again, about fees. GMX up 42%. I don't own any of that, but perhaps I should look into how much fees it's making because it's making a bunch of fees. Rocket Pool and Lido both up 32 and 37%. Uh, Immutable X, a layer two, up 30%. Uh, Uniswap up 10%. I just feel like it's ETH maxi token season right now and it's just making feel really good. And there's like a, almost an oxymoron about ETH maxi token season because like if you're an ETH maxi, then you only buy ETH. But that's not actually true because if you're an ETH maxi, quote unquote, then you also must believe in the tokens in the ecosystem. So when I see all of like these tokens that are heavily aligned with the Ethereum protocol going up, I'm like, nice. Are you going nice. to sell, like how much of these would you sell ETH for in order to get in though? That's the harder part, right? 
Yeah. Like fiat's easy, but which of these are going to yeah. continue to go up in ETH denominated yeah. terms? It's always hard. That's it's the hard part. Hard. I th- it's always hard. I don't know. <laughs> Whenever I get to that point, I'm like, ah, I don't want to sell my ETH. <laughs> right, right, right. Ryan, what are you bullish on? Uh, I am bullish on the Ethereum roadmap. So yeah. we obviously have like, uh, if you zoom out, we have the merge coming up, right? That's an mm-hmm. economic upgrade. So we get 90% issuance reduction, more security. We talked about that. Um, our discussion with Polenia uh, around EIP 4844 this past week made me excited about kind of the, the next upgrade of Ethereum. So first we have an economic upgrade with the merge, but hopefully, fingers crossed, the hard fork after that we'll get something like EIP 4844, which makes rollups a thousand X cheaper potentially when you add all of the rollup compression techniques with um, EIP 4844, you get a thousand X cheaper rollups, this mm-hmm. according to Polenia. Um, that's big. So we got yeah, first an economic upgrade. Number. Yeah, and then we got a scalability upgrade. And then David, we just had a conversation with um, Stefan from Flashbots this mm-hmm. week about MEV, that's maximum extractable value, um, mitigations. And that is kicking in right after the merge. It's a long story, but Flashbots has a project called MEV Boost that all validators will use that also generates more returns for anyone who who uses it as, as, as a staker. But I'm actually really excited about the MEV protection that's going to be baked into Ethereum at the protocol level as well. This is called Protocol Builder Separation, PBS. And that is coming sometime after EIP 4844 in the future. All this to say, I've probably never been more excited about the Ethereum roadmap. And the reason I'm most excited is because um, I feel like we finally got our shit together on it. Yeah. Like from an ec- like it's actually defined. Yeah. There was a while where like, honestly, Ethereum didn't have it together. Right. From a roadmap perspective. Time. I would yeah. say it was 20, late 2019 was when it finally came together. Yeah. We didn't have, yeah. like, kind of the monetary policy was like, yeah. I don't know, we'll wait for proof of stake. We have that figured out with a merge. Right. Scalability, I don't know. Plasma, state channels, Plasma. what's it going to be? No, now we have a path, roll-up centric right. uh, roadmap, EIP 4844, like, that's within sight. Uh, how are we going to solve this MEV problem, MEV boost, PBS? Like, the roadmap's looking good these days. I'm pretty right. bullish on it. Yeah, no, it's looking good, and it also makes like fundamental sense. Kind of like going back to what like, Kelvin fin- Finchner was saying about the three theoretical like maximum. Like there are things about the Ethereum roadmap, the design philosophy that is just like the theoretical best way to execute on an idea. Um, and I don't have that enough time to go into that right now, but I'll tease an article that I think is coming out next week, which is what you're alluding to, which is about the blockchain supply chain, as in like how a block becomes produced on Ethereum and where the value goes in that supply chain and how it ultimately always converges down to ETH stakers. Um, and so uh, I think we are bullish on the same thing, brother. All right. What's uh, the meme of the week this week? What are we looking at? Meme of the week. Meme of the week. <laughs> we are, <laughs> this is a Top Gun poster, uh, Top Gun Maverick, but instead we got Nancy Pelosi in this F-18 zooming her way to Taiwan. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Like, for people who haven't been watching the news, what's the context for this? <laughs> Yeah, Nancy Pelosi went to Taiwan of her own accord. Interestingly, after her husband bought a bunch of calls in Taiwan semiconductor businesses right before a bill went to Congress. <laughs> so that's a different story. But then Nancy Pelosi, of her own accord, not as a part of her job as Secretary of State or whatever she is, Speaker of the House, uh, the House. Des- decides to go to Taiwan and thoroughly pisses off China, who is now, now as a result, doing military ex- exercises in that region as well. So Nancy Pelosi just going rogue, Top Gun Maverick style, getting her, getting herself into Taiwan and pissing off the two biggest superpowers or one of the biggest superpowers in the world. Nice job, uh, Nancy. Well, the 2020s, geopolitical tension, that's going to be yeah. fun. Um, yeah. I feel like we need Throw to do an episode on that Nancy in the future. Pelosi in there. Yeah. Sick. <laughs> Guys, uh, as always, it's been great to have you. Of course, crypto is risky. You could lose what you put in. But we are headed west. This is the frontier. It's not for everyone, but we're glad you're with us on the Bankless journey. Thanks a lot. Hey, we hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, head over to Bankless HQ right now to develop your crypto investing skills and learn how to free yourself from banks and gain your financial independence. We recommend joining our daily newsletter, podcast, and community as a Bankless Premium subscriber to get the most out of your Bankless experience. You'll get access to our market analysis, our alpha leaks, and exclusive content, and even the Bankless token for airdrops, raffles, and unlocks. If you're interested in crypto, the Bankless community is where you want to be. 
Click the link in the description to become a Bankless Premium subscriber today. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel for in-depth interviews with industry leaders, Ask Me Anythings, and weekly roll-ups where we summarize the week in crypto and other fantastic content. Thanks everyone for watching and being on the journey as we build out the Bankless Nation.